Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 129 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am your host, Pervez Ahmed, and I am joined, as always, by our beloved co-host, Omar Ansari. Beloved. Wow. Sound like I'm <laughs> listeners. Sound like I'm Pervez. I figured, I figured in the 10th anniversary, it's it's about time that the co-host or, or the host of the show gets a beloved before the I'll take it. I'll take it. I, 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 sometimes people could all use, use a little... Uh, a little, uh, uh, you know, terms of endearment every now and then. But um, hey, right. congrats! You you are entering season ten of the show. I just saw that. Uh, so congrats to you and Zucky for you know well, for celebrating ten years since finding the show, founding the show. Well, thank you. I can't believe ten years have passed. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I, it's, it doesn't feel like ten years, and it's been a wonderful journey. And we've met with some amazing individuals and had some amazing conversations. Um, I don't think today is going to be um, any different uh, in both of those fronts. Um, you know, we've discussed the issue of spiritual abuse on our show several times. Um, for those of you who have heard these episodes, you know that we, I, have expressed my reservations with the term spiritual abuse because of its all-encompassing usage. The reason for that is not that I deny or doubt the existence of or instances of spiritual abuse or that abuse, spiritual or otherwise, occurs within the community. It certainly does. Rather, my reservations have been with the term that have, have been that the term fails to capture the nuances, differences, particularities, and dynamics of the instances, personalities, organizations that are involved when we use that term to address sort of as a catch-all all of these various um, cases or instances. Um, however, I think it is an important starting point uh, for an important discussion that we as a Muslim community need to and have to have. Um, and regardless of the inelegant nature of the term, um, that should not preclude these important conversations from taking place. Um, you know, because these instances of spiritual abuse may seem like isolated events, although as we can all attest, you know, the frequency of these are, is, 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 you know, has, has increased over the last few years. Um, these instances are certainly not limited to the Muslim community, in fact, much of the research that I sort of came across <clears throat> when I was preparing for the show um, came up from outside of the Muslim community. Um, furthermore, um, the instances within the Muslim community demonstrate that these are also not, that these are ideologically agnostic. That is to say that uh, it would be foolish to think that these type of instances only occur within particular ideological schools, be it a Sufi order or you know any other sort of you know faith community or micro community, um, these happen in all ideological schools and milieus. Um, however, as the research demonstrates, there are common patterns that we can see emerging from these cases. Um, inshallah, if the time permits, we ho we hope to discuss these on on, on today's show. Um, among the nuances and particularities of these cases is that they center around an individual or occur in an organizational or collective or group context. So sometimes we hear about you know particular cases where it's the individual. Other times we see where it's much more endemic within a particular community or a particular group of individuals. Um, and so these collective or organizational contexts have often been examined within the rubric of what we commonly refer to as cults. Uh, and what's interesting about the word cult is that the word cult comes from the Latin cultus, um, which originally designates a practice of religious veneration um, and this and the religious system that's sort of created around that veneration. So, for example, you know, back in the old days, you would say the cult of Our Lady Guadalupe or, for, for you know, within a sort of Catholic context. Um, but in the 19th and 20th century, you know, the, the like the, the more common usage of the, of the word how we, we use the word cult sort of begins to emerge uh, as sort of, you know, denoting a social group that is socially deviant or has strange beliefs and practices. Um, and so, you know, when, when we hear the term, I think certainly as Americans, you know, we think of like Jim Jones and the People's Temple in San Francisco and Jonestown. You know, we think about Heaven's Gate, the Branch Davidians, David Koresh, um, and this new fascinating case that I did actually a lot of reading about, which is the uh, the, the uh, Nixium case, which mm. involves, um, I think that's how you pronounce it, Nixium, which involves that actress, Allison Mack. She was on the show Smallville. I don't okay. know if you ever watched Smallville, but she was, she was part of that 
cult. And right now there's a series of cases um, that are going on with regards to those who were criminally prosecuted uh, for what, 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 what occurred there. Um, anyway, that's a really long way of saying, um, and I can't certainly promise that we're going to get to all of that, but I hope that we at least delve into some of this with today's guest. Um, we're joined today by Yusuf Azhar, who spent 13 years with an organization or with a group that he now characterizes as a, as a cult. Um, he's here to discuss the what precipitated for him to join the group and what eventually transpired for him to leave the group. Um, it's certainly a very personal and painful chapter of his life, as I can imagine. And we are really grateful that he joins us to share his personal experiences. So I want to also personally commend you for the courage to speak out because I know that itself is not very easy. Um, so a little bit about Yusuf. Yusuf Asar was born in India and migrated to the United States at the age of two. Yusuf holds a BA in rhetoric and communication from UC Davis, right here, not too far away, um, and uh, an MS in business information technology from DePaul University in Chicago. He studied Arabic at the University of Damascus for one year and general Islamic sciences with various scholars throughout his life. He now resides in the Bay Area with his wife and three children, working as a software testing lead at a technology company here in Silicon Valley. So anyway, sorry for the long intro. Yusuf, it's great to have you on the show. So welcome. Thank you Thank so much for having me. Welcome, Sam. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. I appreciate it. So I know, yeah, I mean, I guess we can get into if you had any thoughts about what I said or what I was talking about, the topics that we have covered, as I, as I, I think, mentioned to you both off air as well as, you know, in my introduction, we have certainly talked about this issue of spiritual abuse, but again, the, I, like I said, the sort of given problematic nature of using a term that is, or, or the, the way that the term is used to sort of encompass all types of different particularities, even though the instances are not always the same, um, you know, the, the, the actual events are not the same. So I think there's some nuance that's needed. Um, but I think what makes your, your story very unique um, is I think that we are talking about more of a sort of a group dynamic. Uh, certainly, and we'll get into this, but it, it all stems from an individual, but there's also sort of something that happens when you have a group that coalesces around a charismatic individual, and then what sort of occurs, um, you know, behind the safety of that, of, of kind of an organizational setting. Um, but anyway, I guess we'll, we'll get to that, but I'd love to sort of hear your origin story. Um, you're born in India, but you came here at a very young age. Um, where's here, first of all? Were you, did you come to California? Um, I came to Davis, California. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. So that's where I grew up, Davis, California. Got it. And then moved to the Bay Area after I got married. Mm -hmm. And your wife's from the Bay Area. My wife, um, she's originally from Afghanistan uh, and then was a war refugee. Uh, came to the East Coast initially, stayed there for a few years, and then her family um, eventually settled in the Bay Area. Got it, got it. Um, and then, so you were living, uh, so ap after you got married, you said you moved to the Bay Area. Correct, yeah. Okay. Um, so at that time, what's sort of your religious orientation? What's kind of your family background? I mean, like your uh, your, your your roots are, for, your, are from India, so ch yep. child of immigrant parents from India. Um, yeah. also specifically Hyderabad. So Correct. You know. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, the, uh, so yeah, what was sort of the religious orientation growing up for you? So, yeah, so that's a great question. I, and I think that's actually a really good place to start because okay. I think that does all play into what eventually happened. Um, <clears throat> grew up, you know, in a family where practicing and then not super duper religious in the sense of like there's no scholars in our family and it wasn't like the i don't know how to describe it really like yeah. they were practicing identified as muslims absolutely um my dad used to actually went through a lot of trouble to make sure that we me and my brothers all learned basics of islam and are being able to recite quran and things like that um he was very involved with the local community in davis helped establish the sunday school and those kinds of things but but none of it really took hold in me if that makes sense like i was just muslim because that was part of my identity and that was i didn't really think a whole lot about it um and i know on one of your shows you talked a lot about identity and, and i was listening to that i was like wow that really resonates with me because i was very confused am i american am i indian it was more of that actually mm -hmm. not even the muslim aspect of it like who am i 
until I was about 10 years old, we took a trip to India. And then I was like, oh, I'm definitely not Indian. <laughs> well, that, that's funny because I can I can relate to that. It happened to me at 15. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, so the same thing? I had the same thing, yeah. I went, yeah. To, I went to India at age 15. And there you go. Just, it was almost the same exact reaction. <laughs> like literally two episodes ago when we were on with Shadi Hamid, he's Egyptian-American. And uh -huh. I was saying that for most hyphenated Americans, they don't realize how much more that the American part of that hyphenated, uh, you know, um, uh, definition until they go visit their home country and then you realize <laughs> exactly. okay i am <laughs> i'm egyptian american that's when yes. you take a stance that's when you take a stance <laughs> exactly so yeah. can, can yeah. completely relate exactly. to that as well um yeah yeah so okay, okay so so not 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 overtly religious i think you right. i think we all three of us on the table here have a very similar experience in terms right. of our of the, the way we were raised um not entirely secular not ultra religious but you know, we were taught how to pray. We were exactly. taught how to read Quran. That was essentials, right. adab, manners, exactly. respect for elders. Don't eat pork. Don't yeah. drink alcohol. There you go. No girlfriends. That right. was about it, though. Yeah. I didn't know a lot more than that. Got it. You know. So when do you have your sort of moment? That moment of epiphany when we all do. You know, people always right. talk about conversion stories, but even for yes. us, you know, born into the faith, we have that moment 100%. or that epiphany that leads Absolutely. us to now saying, okay, you know what? I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna take this serious. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so that happened to me when I was 15. At that time, yeah. we, were, we, we briefly had moved to this city called Blythe in, uh, it's in California, it borders Arizona. Yeah. Uh, it's in, you know, so you can imagine kind of roughly where it's at. Um, my dad worked for the state of California. He was stationed out there for a few years. So there, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm around 15 and I'm kind of like, you know, becoming a man. And I'm like, what is the point of all this? Why do we exist? What's going on here? And combined with just, I saw a lot of stupidity in, in, in our community, unfortunately. Um, the, the, we, so there were seven Muslims in that city. There's our family of six Muslims and one bachelor. That was it. So I was going to pause and ask you yeah. if, if you meant seven families. No, you mean seven individual, seven Muslims. individual Muslims. Okay, got it. So there was not really any right. community support. Um, in that context, though, I read a translation of the Quran and that just changed everything for me instantly. I was like, okay, this, this is what I was looking for. So it wasn't, it was really had very, I mean, my parents, of course, prepared the ground and, you know, had, uh, you know, raised me with this Muslim context, but it wasn't until I read the Quran for myself, English translation, and that's when it really hit. Yeah. And then that was it from that point on until, until now. Is this uh, late eighties, early nineties timeframe? This is uh, late eighties. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And so what I also find, uh, you know, and, and I share your own background story in that regard of like, like we, like we said, you know, kind of religiously situating us, not super secular, but also not super overly practicing or, you know, ultra religious. What that lends itself up to is, is once you do get into say college, especially where now you have competing ideas and you're introduced to a whole new world. And sometimes you're also introduced to a very active Muslim scene, whether it's the MSA or whatever, what have you. Um, now you're suddenly facing real, I, like you, you begin to be introduced to the various ideological sort of exactly. thinking and, and groups and movements, whatever you want to call it, within, within Islam, within, like within Islamdom. So I think a similar thing happens to you, right? You yes. get to college yes. and you're introduced to... Yes, I'm introduced to Hizb Yeah. So for those who don't know, know yeah. for the uninitiated, yes. can you tell us a little bit about Hizb Tahrir? Sure. Basically, they're, they're a, a they describe themselves as a political party, yeah. um, and their goal is to reestablish the Khilafah. Yeah. So they're all about politics, Islamic State. And um, they say, you know, openly that we're not trying to do anything like that in Western countries. I mean, specifically in Muslim countries. Um, and so my dad was heavily involved with this group. So technically, we were never members because they have this weird thing about whether you're a member or not, or not, or if you're just studying with them. So we were just technically just studying with them, but we were all in. Like emotionally, I was I was completely like you know loyal to this ideology, you could say. Um, and you're right. So that came up around uh, college, my college years. Um, before that, when I was in high school in Davis. Um, I was exposed to the Bleed Jamaat, for example, like the modernist type Muslims, um, Salafis, those kind of things. Uh, but but when I when I met his the her you know members, um, that it took a little while actually for me to even 
kind of like accept it. Mm -hmm. But when I did, I was all in. Mm -hmm. And then that lasted for 10 years. I I was kind of with them for for 10 years. And and real quick, so for the uninitiated, and I don't know too much about it myself, is this like typically more uh, tied tied to a specific um, country? Like are they typically from one part of the Muslim world or another? And also just curious, is this like a very early 90s phenomenon that's since disappeared? Or I'm just curious what the current context is. I think I was just about to say, I, th- I think it's certainly early 90s yeah. for you. Like, yep. I'm, I'm thinking your time exactly frame. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because I know you and I are same vintage. So yep. when you started college, I started college. Exactly. Um, yeah. You know, um, and so his with that here for, to, to Omar's question, not, not, I wouldn't say it's tied to a, to, to a particular country. No, not really. Um, it's an offshoot. You, you could argue it's an offshoot of, what I like to put under the category or rubric of like movement Islam. So it's, you know, in, in the same vein of like Jamaat Islami or his, uh, or, uh, uh, Ikhwan al-Muslimun, Ikhwan yeah. uh, although with slightly a little bit more nuanced, it's because it's all about the establishment of the Islamic state and they deem any kind of political involvement within existing democratic systems as to be kufr, to be like disbelief. Mm. And so there's no voting, there's no getting politically involved through the existing uh, 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 you know, mechanics uh, of, of, of a democracy. However, the idea is that we need to create a khilafat. We it. need to, and, and yeah. the khilafat, right? I mean, that reminds me because, I mean, you, when you and I met for the first time, you were talking about, I think the name of the group was literally California. <laughs> right. <laughs> they had a magazine. They had a magazine in Southern California called That's right. California. Yes. Oh, so they put out the magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that was their okay. magazine. Okay, so yeah. I do remember the magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It so, was big at one point. Yeah, yeah, it's so fascinating. So um, I, I just didn't know that was the name of the organization. I thought because the magazine came out of Southern California, it was like a play on words. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but yeah, exactly. California, okay. Yeah. So yeah, the idea is the establishment of the Islamic State, Omar, and that like that's going to solve all mm-hmm. of our problems. And, you know, and of course they have Quran and, and you know, uh, Sira, you know, lessons from the Prophet, you know, Ahadith, of course, to all, to back all of that up. You know, and that's yeah. the thing I think that I, that I think I think a lot of people also should be or not aware of, but also appreciate that the thing with all of these sort of movements, these groups, these you know ideological affiliations is that they all have their sort of textual backing, right? Yeah. N- none of them are saying, okay, you know, we're going to quote you, you know, uh, right? Like, yeah, or, it's not random. I mean, it's, it's not random. random thank yeah, you. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. So any, anyway, so. This, so that's sort of your frame. Now you say you were you went all in and you lasted within that sort of, um, you know, within, within his with that year. Probably not to a formal extent, but like for ten Correct. years. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry. No, 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 I was just gonna. So, so, so then what? Um, I, I but I think it's also important. I, I think, and sorry, I, I think why the early '90s came to mind when you brought it up. Also, in addition to just knowing you know that you and I are the same age, is that the early '90s were also a very interesting period in the sense that. Uh, especially for a lot of these groups and movements, um, because there was a lot going on in the world. I mean, exactly. there, there was a yes. lot of troubling events. Exactly. There was what was happening in Bosnia, yep. in the Caucasus. Uh, you know, I think especially the war in Bosnia and, and the events that were happening there, the massacre of Muslims, the, that was like a real galvanizing. Well, yeah. uh, the 100%. Yeah. And that, that's actually what got me into this m- mindset of like, oh my God, we have to do something. They're slaughtering something. us. They're raping our women. You know, and it wasn't just that. There was a, the whole Afghanistan thing was going on. Mm-hmm. Palestine Sheshmi was in the news. Palestine was, yeah. of course, in the news. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of things. There's even Philippines, I think. There was, That's there was right. The Philippines, the Philippines, Kashmir. So, I Kashmir. mean, things that are unfortunately still ongoing. But, right. um, you know, but but yeah, those become sort of really galvanizing moments. Exactly. Especially for a young 20-year-old. You know, because you're, you're passionate, you're zealot as it is, you're zealous as it is, just by virtue of being young, um, and so <laughs> yeah. you know that also becomes really appealing about about the about these groups. Yeah, you you come in, you know, you got a bunch of young young men and women, and they're frustrated, and they don't they're, they feel helpless about what's going on, mm-hmm. and you say, well, guess what? I have a solution to all this stuff. It's going to fix everybody's problems, right. and then you are attracted to it, whether That's it seems right. you know reasonable it's, or not. And it's easy. It's an out of the box solution. Yep. It's you know it, it requires very little sort of you know buy in on your part other than a commitment to the cause but in terms of like there's no like years of learning and you know getting you know developing an expertise in the tradition none of that it's just look 
Just start studying with them. There you go. Go to conferences and yeah. disrupt them and <laughs> stuff like that. Right. Which right. I'm just being honest. Like that's yeah. what we actually used to do. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. I remember. <laughs> so does this? So does this? Is the next kind of step coming out of that your your overseas travels or is there something yeah. happens in between? Yeah. So what happens? Okay. So so exactly. So uh, so that's the situation. Is I'm, I'm I'm in this group, but when I get married, my wife starts studying at um, Zaytuna. And I get exposed to more like traditional scholars, mm -hmm. which going into it from a, his with a hair background, I, you know, they're a little bit skeptical, a lot of these, uh, these types of scholars and these kind of organizations, but you know, this is my wife. And so I went anyway. And over time I started to, to appreciate it and, and, and the teachers there. Um, and so eventually, um, I met a, uh, one of their, the teachers that they had there, that's why I was mentioning Sheikh Mohammed Yaqubi. Um, and then we got close to his family. My wife became friends with his uh, wife, who sadly passed away at Um But what that led to was a, us taking a trip before we had children to Syria to study um, Arabic. And that was not the, the norm for his Zahir type people. It, it, that was a lot more of the influence of, I don't, I'm sure you remember those days at, mm -hmm. uh, at Zaytun, like a lot of people were going back and forth overseas yeah. and stuff. So we did that. And then when we did that, we... Um, got exposed more to to the traditional uh, scholars, um, opened my eyes a lot. Like I was just like, oh, these are not just corrupt scholars who are just supporting the government, regimes, blindly, mm -hmm. regimes and mm -hmm. stuff like that. These are just good people just trying to live and, you know, practice Islam, you know. Um, and the other thing that happened was I studied a text with Sheikh Mohammed Yaqubi about um, the, specifically about the, the Sheikh Murid relationship in a Sufi context. Mm. Does that make sense to it? Yeah. yeah. So that really opened my eyes because I was like, oh, I thought I was going to hate all this stuff and, and I thought I was going to be really against it, but it actually was very appealing. Right. I mean, I, 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 I think it goes without saying, I think, and for most of our listeners, they get it, um, but just in case, yeah. right, just for nomenclature yep. um, and definition. So Sheikh Murid, by that you mean, you know, you have a religious uh, teacher, uh, guide, if you will, a religious teacher, religious guide, mentor. Um, you know, maybe even in a modern context, you would say like a spiritual guru. And then yep. the murid is the disciple. He's the adherent. And, yep. but there's also, obviously there's a lot of subtlety there. There's a lot of nuance. Uh, and so maybe, and I know we're going to get into that, but so you're introduced to this idea of like the Sheikh murid, uh, right? Yep, um, exactly. through this, through this reading of a text with Sheikh Yaqubi yes. here at Zaytuna Institute in the Bay Area. It was, so, so, that, so that was actually happened in Damascus. Uh, oh, okay. So you, you already gone overseas. Yeah, exactly. Now. By that point, I'd gone, okay. gone overseas. What was, the, Arabic what was the interest there? I mean, purely language? I mean, you wanted to... Uh, yeah, the, the main reason to go there yeah. was to study Arabic so that we could continue studying other texts, uh, you know, Islamic texts in Arabic. Um, but while we were there, he um, he had some of his students, Sheikh Mohammed Yaqubi, some of his students were coming to spend time with him and they're all coming from overseas, at least the ones I met. And so he told me, because again, we were close to his family. He said, Hey, I'm going to be teaching this text. Do you want to sit with us? Mm -hmm. I said, sure. I'd love to. So I, so then I, that's when I sat with him there and, and studied that. And, and what you're seeing in Syria is, is just that, that relationship, you know, and maybe even this idea of like a tariqa in a Sufi order, kind of, you're seeing it in real life, right? Because that's exactly. kind of the, the, like what you're surrounded by. And and it's a what it's a positive experience in your time in yeah. Damascus. So it, it was overall positive. Um, I so one of the things I told him was that, you know, I'm not before I went even. What this is in Hayward, I think we were at his place once, mm -hmm. and and I was and we were just talking about our plans to to go to Damascus, and I told him. That, you know, look, I'm not interested in going to like um, thicker gatherings and stuff like that. I had not told him I'm in his hair, by the way. Mm. So he didn't know. I was just, I just liked him a lot as a person. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I didn't want to mess it up by bringing up all these political things. So, and I, and I, by that point, I had studied some stuff with him at Zaytuna and I really enjoyed it and benefited from it. So um, I told him that like, I don't want to go to thicker gatherings and things. But what happened when we got there was he took me anyway. <laughs> so he took me to like Hadras and stuff. Mm. And until now, no offense to anybody, I know I know that's like all like there's you know legal backing for all of it. I just personally was not comfortable with it. So everyone I went to, um, I would just just made me feel a little funny. They can be pretty intense. They were very yeah, intense yeah, yeah. over especially there, especially Hadras, and I can imagine in Syria even more so. Right. Very, and can very you quit just briefly? Sorry. Just, yeah. Can you just characterize 
um, sure. what that entails, just real briefly. Sure. I mean, people probably about? are familiar with Vickers, but sure. maybe characterize specifically what that experience was. Yeah, so yeah. the ones I went to, what would happen is you'd go to a to a masjid or a room um, connected to a masjid, and these are like really cool old masjids, you know, like right. in, again Damascus, like from sure. the Ottoman era and that kind of stuff. No older Umayyad, or even yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we didn't go to that oh, those okay, ones, okay, but sorry, okay. um, no, no problem. Yeah. But you're right. There, yeah. There's like oh, tons of right. really really old masjids. They're super cool. Anyway. They would they would be in a room, you'd have the sheikh sitting in the front, and um, he'd you'd have his marids disciples kind of like around him, maybe in a circle or a semicircle, and in in concentric rows. So what will happen is um, they'll start doing like a dhikr, like Allah 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 Allah, and they'll speed up the cadence of it. And, it, and they start off sitting, and eventually it gets so intense and so fast, they st everybody stands up all of a sudden, and then they're holding hands, and they're jumping, and then some guy's dancing at some point in the front. Mm. <laughs> Not like a disco dance, but like yeah, they right. just have a whatever. And then the sheikh or somebody, or one of uh, somebody, I guess, who he assigns, um, starts to sing. So, <clears throat> again, like, I don't think there's any Sharia issue with any of this stuff that I know of, but I just didn't feel comfortable in right. it. So. Know. You know, it's interesting because <clears throat> um, we've talked about you knowing you're more American than Indian. I think there's a cultural element that the, these, and I'm just kind of theorizing here, but the different ways of doing vicars around the Muslim world have a strong cultural component. Yeah, and oh, very much I can so. kind of relate to that where I'm like, I'm American. I'm not sure I fully, I like the kind of the Islamic piece of this, but there's this whole cultural piece that... I'm kind of looking at more like an outsider. Doesn't mean I'm against it. It's just like you. I'm not necessarily in in my zone there. Oh, very much so. Yeah, I mean, right. I, I like meaning I, like the the, the the cultural component. In yeah. fact, I, you know, much to my like, not chagrin, but like I, I would say like w w one one of the things that sort of again bothers me is also very strong. But with a lot of the sort of traditional scholars here in the United States, like and I, and, I, and I'm using air quotes here, but, you know, people who are, you know, connected to the tradition, traditional Islam, the madahib, the turuq, the spiritual paths and so on, um, is that, is that we haven't named the fact that it's a very specific, culturally specific uh, modality of dhikr and of Sufism. So for example, when we talk about, typically when we, when, when we look at Sufi organizations in the United States, let's say for example, by and large, these are organizations that are very um, either uh, Yemeni, like, like, the, like, their, like their stock, like their, their lineage is <clears throat> from Yemen, it's maybe from the Levant uh, and North Africa. Like that's sure. that's the flavor of Sufism that I think by and large the Muslim community in America knows of. Whereas, for example, there is a rich tradition of Sufism that comes out of the subcontinent. Yeah, and this is where I mean, where I say kind of to my chagrin because I mean, obviously as an Indian, like I feel like like yo, dude, there's like a whole flavor of tra of, of traditional Sufism that we're not even being introduced to in America because again, that's not sort of the, the like the flavor that is you know, sort of most, and again, I don't think that's by design. That's just that the scholars who came and sort of, you know, kind of connected us to that discourse, they themselves studied in North Africa or Yemen or the Levant, you know, and they didn't study in the subcontinent. Although I think we're going to get to the subcontinent. Yeah. <laughs> right. In a very yeah. interesting kind of twist. But um, yeah, so I, but I think Omar raises, that's a, that's a really, I think like, uh, you know, something to pause and kind of reflect on as well, even though it's not exactly re related to what yeah, no, you know, your experience. Yeah, no, I think it's very true. Yeah. yeah I right. think it's very, very true. Is and, and that's part of actually what I learned was that a lot of the, the, the Sufi, um, I just call them traditions, especially the singing and things like that was specifically to attract people. Mm -hmm. But then, if you just hold on to that and it's a, and you're really rigid about it, and then over time, if it repels people, they don't change it. Mm. Even though the original intention was, it's just a way of like the low, you know, like you said, like North, North Africa, right. there's a lot of singing going on there. So you just do some singing and it attracts people. Well, now your singing is about Allah and stuff like that. 
So it attracts them. Right. But then over time, if there's a group of pe- subculture where they're not so comfortable with it, they won't change that necessarily. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think I think th- I think there is a strong component of that. Certainly, and and and, and you see that even with the with the various sort of Sufi orders. Um, you know, again, commonly used or the, the common expression, commonly expressed as, you know, tariqas or turuq, is that um, they're also very much informed by the culture okay. uh, from which they originate. Um, because again, within the various Sufi orders, depending on what part of the Muslim world they're from, uh, you know, again, those even, even those practices are very nuanced. So for example, you can have bona fide Sufi turuq, you know, tariqas, turuq, where there is no group thicker, or it's not done on a consistent, like weekly or something basis. Yeah. It's done in sort of a once in a while or on special occasions, or things like that. Yeah, so, or 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 they or some groups don't even allow out loud thicker, for example. Exactly. It's all silent. It's all silent. Yeah. Right. Right. So okay. Yeah, so sorry, you're in. We're getting into the weeds and, a little yeah, bit. And then you okay. you 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 basically did you get what you needed to get done there and just decide to come back, or was there a, a different kind of story behind coming back? Yeah. Yeah. So. The reason we actually cut the trip short, it was supposed to be for two years there. We found out my wife was expecting. Mm. So we cut the trip short after a year, came back. And what's so, so here's the funny thing that happened around that time. There, there was actually several different forces. One was, this is, I'm talking about like 2002 when we came back. So 9 11 had just happened. Mm. So there's all this tension and there's, there's a lot of talk about, Muslims being in concentration camps. I don't know if you guys remember that, but at least in my circle, there was people were saying stuff like that quite a bit. And so we were in the mindset of like, hey, let's just go back to the Middle East. Let's have our kid and go back to the Middle East. That was one thing. Um, also, Hizb Tahrir at that point had an internal split. Mm. So that was a really big deal for me because I had just been so like, even in Syria, I was like, yeah, this is all cool, but I'm still a, you I know, see. Oh. a Tahriri at heart. You know, I didn't realize. So I always, that. Yeah, so I always had that in, in like I just in the in the back of my mind, like yeah, this is, this is interesting, but this is who I really am. Mm. And but when I came back to um, to the U.S. and specifically went up in Southern California, mm-hmm. where there's a much stronger presence uh, of Tahrirs. So there, when I saw the split, uh, it really affected me because I was just like, wow, these guys are just like fighting with each other, and it's like really ugly, and I never expected it. Being not familiar with, like, again, the sort of, you know, how it works and operates in, like, a Tahriri sort of um, setting, um, isn't there any pushback uh, among the fellow Tahriris that, why are you going and studying Sufism, and this is Bada? You don't have any of that? Like, see, that that's sort of my orientation. So, you know, like, for example, like, I was taught to repel against Sufism, right? Because it was a bid'a and it was an innovation, and it was wrong, and it was misguidance, and so on. Dahris, are, are, are they not so involved with that kind of discourse and language? No, they are. They okay. are. But what happened in my case was, what I had told everybody is, I'm going there to study Arabic. Right. And that is well, that was the original reason. True. When I got there is when I started kind of quietly learning about these Sufi things. So they didn't even know about it. Got it. But got you're it. right. Had they known about it, they would have given me a hard time. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Um, so, so, so do you come back to the U.S. Yeah, then? you come back. Yeah, despite, so come back. Despite the concerns of post 9-11? Yep, yep. We come back to okay. the U.S. Uh, because my, my family, my wife's family, they're all over mm-hmm. here in right. California. No, and, and in spite of mm-hmm. what you had heard about concentration camps and all this kind of stuff, you, you decide to stay here. That's the other thing. Because you mentioned how Correct. you were thinking about just having the baby and then going back. Correct. Right. That's right. So, yeah. yeah. We, we end up just staying here. Okay. Um, and, and then... Um, like I said, that split happens, yeah. or I, I learn about the split. Well, that's not technically true. I kind of knew that there was problems earlier, but it didn't seem like that big of a deal. But when I when when we came back from Syria and settled in Southern California, for because we ended up staying there for a few years, um, at that point I found I realized that the split was much deeper than I thought. And is this a split within organization, like mainstream organizations within the Hizb Tahrir? Like how how is it structured? So the way it was. The, the main one of the some of the main people of his Tahrir in Southern California decided that the the leadership of his Tahrir internationally was problematic. They had something I don't even remember the details now, sure. but they had some issue with it. Got it. So a lot of the people in Southern California um, were against them, and then a few people in Southern California were like, "No, we're not splitting off." So it was just kind of like this constant, you know, arguing about things. Got it. So and children change everything. So you pro- my guess is then you're busy with the, you're busy with the raising kids. You're 
re re um, kind of integrating back in, uh, into American life. Exactly. But then at some point you decide to now re pursue your student studies, but within America. Is that right? Kind of, yeah. So what what I do is I um, I look for another traditional scholar because I had such a good experience with Zaytuna and mm -hmm. you know scholars right. in, in Syria. I was like, let me find another um, traditional scholar, specifically Hanafi, because I was I'm, I am Hanafi and I was always. So just a quick side note, <laughs> I, I studied Maliki at Zaytuna for a little bit, yeah, and it confused me so badly, probably for like a year or two before. I, Maybe you and I Omar had the same Maliki teacher, <laughs> Maliki Fik teacher out of Zaytuna. I, I, that's funny. I, I did the same thing, and I, I yeah. thought it was very beneficial. And I was yeah. very oh, really? grateful to the, oh, to the teacher Yusuf Ismail who who, who spent. Oh, you my know, teacher was Sheikh Hamza. Time, time, time teaching. Me, Your teacher was Sheikh Hamza. Okay. Yeah, yeah and, there you go. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, I just, I think after, just as a side note, when you, when ninety nine point nine percent of your family and everybody Hanafi. around you is Hanafi, right. it's, you do it does cause a little confusion, unnecessary confusion. Yeah. So, um, and then you mentioned children, especially when then you have children, and it's like, okay, dad's praying, yeah, you know, yeah Sada, exactly, and everyone exactly. else is praying, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but it was uh, it was it was good good to see the the different perspectives. And, Certainly. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it was it was cool. Yeah. I, I learned so much yeah. there, you know, during my time. because again, like, and again, like I'm. I'm maybe projecting here, but I can imagine within his, like Tahriri, his with Tahrir, like discourse, Madahib, and are you a Hanafi, are you a Shafi? Like that's, that, that doesn't really play out. So here's a funny thing. Yeah. They, they actually do oh, um, okay. respect stuff like that. Okay. So there's this common misconception that they're very similar to Salafi, but they're, okay. they're actually not. And that's what all. I mean by projecting because I'm totally projecting yeah, my yeah. own. I had a feeling because I get, that's common. <laughs> that's actually. Because when you have that, those experiences that when you get to campus, when, when you get to college, uh, you know, with his Hizbutah here. Meanwhile, you know, a few thousand miles away, Burbez, a young freshman in college, and then I'm introduced to like Dawit the Sadafiya. So, like, and I right. go full in. So that's why wow. I'm I'm doing a lot of <laughs> projecting. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's yeah. okay. That's okay. Yeah. yeah so please, yeah, tell me that little nuance. So, so like, so like, it's legit to like talk about madhabs and to be a yeah. like I'm a Hanafi, I'm a Shafi, whatever. So yeah, I mean, it was you know the group was started yeah. by a very valid, well recognized scholar, um, uh, Sheikh Taqi Nabhani. Mm. His his Nabahani, yeah. yeah, his I think his grandfather was Sheikh Yusuf of Nabahani, who's also a very well respected and scholar from his time, a long time ago, right. for Ottoman time, I think. And so he he comes from from that line. Um, now, what has what the members of the group did later on? May you know we might have a problem with it, but but it's very grounded in traditional um, fiqh and Islam. It is traditional Islam, let's just say. Got it. Yeah. So no, absolutely. They they recommend or they recognize and respect madhab and things right. like that, which is why I was I was so okay with and actually happy about studying Hanafi fiqh with Sheikh Muhammad Yaqubi and other scholars. Right. So so you said you're, you're so you come back to the United States, you're 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 reacclimating, resettling, you've got kids yep. or you have a, you have a daughter now. And then you you want to continue your studies and you're seeing meanwhile the organization that you were once affiliated with is sort of a mess. Right. So you're like, "All right, there's nothing going on there. So let me pursue, you know, let me continue pursuing traditional or, or studies within a traditional, you know, uh, setting." Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Pursuit. Yep. And mm -hmm. so that's when I meet Mufti Abdurrahman Mangera in Santa Barbara area. He okay. was there at that time. And I meet up with him, love him, start studying Hanafi Fiqh with him. And then he introduced, so keep in mind, so the background is just to reiterate, I, I, uh, is the hair background, but I'm, I, but I'm very disillusioned with it now because of the infighting. And then I've just been introduced to Sufi Islam and I like it. And then, so now, now I'm with Mufti Abdurrahman. And he says, "Well, I just met a sheikh who's like really amazing." And and then he tells me, and I am, and, and you know, as we talked about before the show, I'll I'll try to not name their names because I think it'll just add unnecessary distraction. Sure. But he he he's a he's a, a pretty well known um, Sufi sheikh from Pakistan. I see. Based out of Pakistan, mm -hmm. he tells me that he saw him and that he spent time with him and that he, he and he loved it. So I'm like, oh, wow, I want to learn more about this person. So I start studying him. He has lectures online and things like that. And this yeah. is, a, at the time, Mufti Abdul Rahman is in Southern California. He, Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara, okay, because he later, he goes to England, right? Correct. He okay. goes back. Yeah, he's from England. He's from England. And so right. he goes back to England Got later. It, right. yeah. yeah. I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting him as well. So, yeah, um, yeah, beautiful gem of a human being. Uh, he's written quite a lot and translated a lot of works as well. Exactly. So definitely yeah, he has a, like a publishing company mm -hmm. and he writes, like you said, a lot, mashallah. Right. White Thread, I think is, is White this, Thread Press. Yeah, yeah, White Thread Press. Um, so anyway, so then 
uh, you, so you're introduced to the sheikh. Right. Heretofore referred to as the sheikh. The sheikh. The sheikh is, is in Pakistan. <laughs> yes, based out of okay. Pakistan. Are you comfortable naming the tariqah or silsila? Oh, sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're Naqshbandi. Okay. So, so maybe a little bit like pausing there sure. and uh, kind of explaining kind of the lay of the land as far as like Sufi orders go. Sure. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I, none of us here are, claim to be experts, but right, right, right. from what you know, and I can chime in with what little I know. So we can just sure. kind of flesh that out for the audience. Yeah, I think that probably the simplest way to think about it yeah. is like just like there are different um, schools of thought for fiqh. There's also different schools of thought for uh, tasawwuf and spirituality. And so historically, there have been different schools. Some people say there's four, just like the Madhavs, Naqshbandi, and whatever. But there, but other people say no, there are some other ones. Whatever they are, there's different. There are different. Um, just well, as you mentioned, turuq or tariqas. Yeah. Um, and I don't think any of them claim to you know like be the only correct uh, way. But you do. They do pick a certain way and then stick to that. Correct. Um, and so this was just one of those. Right. But it's a pretty big one. I think it's one of the probably the biggest, I would guess. I'm not sure. But the Naqshbandi. Naqshbandi, okay. I think. Yeah. So, so typically, you know, as far as the, the landscape goes, you'll find, you know, I think like like you mentioned, Naqshbandi is certainly a big one. Um, Shadili is another very right. big one. Um, there's Qadri. Jishti, Qadri, Qadri, right. Qadri. These are all major Sufi orders. Correct. Now, what gets interesting to me also is then, then within these sort of uh, paths you have like sort of side or yeah, you have sub paths or maybe tributaries which are then yeah. I, I which are commonly referred to as the silsila so you have like naqshbandi mujaddidi you have and that's what we were mujaddidi oh, okay yeah and then you have naqshbandi i don't know the some of the other silsilas yeah but nonetheless wh where do those fit in if you if you know like so what I separates like what makes the naqshbandi mujaddidi different than say main you know the main Naqshbandi. I, I think it's okay. just it's just sort of named after like you have all these lines of um, sheikhs. Right. So they have what they call a shajara. That's right. So like a sheikh will say, okay, here's my shajara. Shajara literally meaning tree, but it's this thing, sort of like my lineage, spiritual lineage, you could say. Right. And of course, they'll always go back to the the Sahaba anum, and then to the Prophet Sallallahu But along the way, they they branch out quite a bit. Right. So you could say like you could think of it as like um, the Naqshbandis are a big branch. Mm -hmm. And then there's a small branch coming off of that based on a particular sheikh who is, um, let's just, I mean, that's what happened. That's why Mujaddidis Got are it. like that. Okay. Um, and so like, if you, it, it's, it's not too hard to understand if you think of it as like, there's a, like a given sheikh will have a whole bunch of, um, representatives mm -hmm. in his lifetime. <clears throat> and then when he passes away, each one of those sheikhs will just start their own little thing. Right. right, each one of those representatives eventually representatives. become the, like sheikhs in, exactly. their own, in their own right. Exactly. Um, okay, and I know we're going to get into name and, like nomenclature. And again, this no is problem. not to get into the weeds. I think this is important yeah. because I think it really, because if we're talking about, and especially if we're throwing around terms like cults and so on, exactly. I think it is really important to kind of understand history and, and, yeah. and make sure we give deference to, you know, structure and, and, and things that are sort of problem-free and then where then potential problems can creep in. Exactly. So that's the intent of doing it. So, uh, sorry, so so the, then you're introduced to this sheikh and, and then what happens? Yeah, so two things happen. One is that that sheikh, who's, like we said, based in Pakistan, he has a khalifa or representative in Chicago. Okay. And so Mufti Abdul Rahman, he also tells me about the representative in Chicago and also praises him as well. And so through him, I, I basically get introduced to both of these people, the main sheikh in Pakistan and that sheikh's Khalifa representative in Chicago. And um, I eventually meet that sheikh. Uh, he had made a trip to California. I met him, blew me away. Um, and uh, actually, let me just talk about that briefly because that was like a really big thing that yeah. happened to me. Mm -hmm. This is the first time I, I, I was in a gathering where like somebody's giving a talk about Islam and he and he starts basically describing the day of judgment and he says specifically that the clearer your image of the day of judgment the easier it is for you to obey Allah SWT. then he proceeds to describe the day of judgment in, in detail now the reality is that in that room was all basically mainly his existing students so they're already sort of primed for this kind of stuff and then me and my friend who are totally brand new to this 
Regardless, though, the atmosphere was everybody was like bawling like babies. And so the combination of being surrounded by grown men crying like babies, and then also his talk was very powerful. I mean, I can't deny it was a very powerful talk. I started crying, and I'd never experienced anything like that before. And I'm talking like really hard crying, like snot dripping out of your nose, mm-hmm. kind of crying. And I was like, what is happening? Like, I've never, ever experienced anything like this. And so that really captured my heart, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, and so I've was, often wondered yeah. because again, I, 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 and I'm familiar with the order. I'm familiar with, with the Sheikh. Um, is his, uh, does he only speak in Urdu? Mainly Urdu. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't think I've ever heard him give a talk in English. Yeah. So does he trans like, is there a translator or there's no need no. because the majority of the people understand? Urdu. Yeah. The majority of people understand. Urdu. Okay. I think that's also kind of maybe worth noting. Yeah. 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 No, that's true. Yeah. And, and, and that's right. Like that, that crowd, the Urdu crowd within this group is actually very different than the English crowd that was around the Khalifa in Chicago, because that Khalifa basically speaks English. I mean, his Urdu is not that strong. So right. he's doing everything in English. And so there's certainly a, a different, like you can track along with the language, a difference in the culture as well. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to definitely unpack that a little bit further. So what do you, so, yeah. what, so what do, you do with that, emo, that, that yeah. emotional impact does something to you? What, what happens? Yeah. So so he gives that talk. And then they were having, this is all like around Fudger time at somebody's house in Southern California. And so after he gives that talk, um, they have breakfast. And then my friend and I purposely sit next to him uh, just in the, in the living room. You know, we're just sitting at the, uh, just eating there and stuff. And then we start ask we, we we say like we try to be respectful and say like can we ask you some questions about you know Sufism and stuff? And he says, Yeah. So we we ask him these questions about like, you know, why are the Sufis so like not they don't care about what's happening in the world and just stuff those mm-hmm. kinds of things. And he answered every single question and it and they all made sense to us at that time. And so to the point that after we asked that, somebody even said, if you want to give Bayat to him right now, you can do it. And I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not ready yet. But, but that was sort of the atmosphere of, of just like, he really won us over <clears throat> in that sense. I, I didn't think yeah. about that as a question, but that yeah. I'm, I'm really glad you raised that because especially given your background, I mean, like you, you've sort of, you know, come of age as far as a Muslim, as far as you as a Muslim goes and your Muslim identity goes within the sort of his, but that or your circle. And here now you're, thinking about pursuing like, you know, uh, or, or joining like sort of the, the, the Sufi order, um, you know, it's from like really hardcore political, right. Sort of movement Islam to sort of very apolitical, very quietist approach to Islam. Almost like to the, like, like it's often criticized, right. One of the criticisms against Sufi orders is that they are so quietist. And they don't, you know, and, and they don't get involved politically and they don't speak out against regimes and so on. So that's, that's really interesting. But yeah. yet you said that, you know, he was asked and, and he answered like to your satisfaction, like for you coming from your own background, 10 plus years in an organization that's yeah. super driven politically. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. I, yeah. I forgot to mention that. And I think that's actually super important is that this is. Okay. Sorry. Um, it is that I'm in this state of, I've done the political thing for 10 years and the result of it is like, I'm seeing people in the group. They don't know how to do will do properly. They don't know how to pray properly. Um, a lot of them can't recite Quran properly. And, and, and I've been exposed to like traditional scholars. So I'm kind of like, wow, like these guys, all these years I've been in, in his, with the yeah, they would talk about solving all the world's problems, haven't solved a single thing yet anyway. But on top of that, they didn't even teach us like so many basic things. Right. And so I kind of, I kind of just was just like, I'm just walking away from this whole thing. Like, I think you guys are, have, have issues. Right. And, and so that's why I was so open to the idea mm. of like, yeah, it's time for me to not worry about all the wor- world's problems. Cause I can't solve them anyway. It's just stress. It's just nonstop stress mm-hmm. and feeling bad about everything. And I don't have any control over it. Right. You know? Right. So that's, yeah. So that's why I was so open to that. Yeah. Yeah. Because, and so like the level of literacy, the level of scholarship that, oh, yeah. you know, that you were once introduced to, and now suddenly it's like a whole new world. Exactly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, and, it, and believe me, I can relate to, even though yeah. like the Salafis do tend to like stress learning you know, but it's like learning that's within a specific, you know what I mean, format. 
and uh, but when you are introduced to the breadth and the scope of like the Muslim, you know, uh, intellectual tradition, it's it's vast and it's overwhelming and it's it's powerful. Yeah. So I can certainly relate to that. Yeah. Um, so so, t t but yeah, tell us more about that relationship now that begins to. Yeah. Yeah. So then I end up um, meeting also the Khalifa of um, the. Uh, Sheikh Zuf, or whoopsie daisy, Mufti Abdul Rahman then introduces me to the Khalifa who lives in Chicago. And although it wasn't the same level of intensity as the Sheikh, um, it was still impressive. And so what ends up happening is I decide that I'm going to take a trip to Chicago. And at this point, I'm very seriously considering giving Bayah because what's happened is like I've had Mufti Abdul Rahman's endorse them. I've, whatever research I've done online, it seems like other scholars are okay with them and, and, and have a good opinion of them. So it's building their credibility, basically. And then the more I learn about them and the more I listen to their lectures and then the more I interact with them, I, I'm introduced to this concept of nisbah or connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and that's, a, that's really key because a lot of it uh, is based on this idea that the sheikh has an actual connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and then that explains what seem like miracles actually to be very frank that they can perform so there's this general sense like as i talk to the other other um marids or students in the group that you know people say like oh such and such thing happened to me or i had this dream or i had this very strange experience or the sheikh seemed to know about things that they shouldn't have known about and just things like that that seemed sort of supernatural almost but then you'd always fall back on, oh, well, they have nisbah, they have connection to Allah, and they can have ilham, they can have um, divine inspiration, they can have dreams. So it starts to create this sense of like, wow, these really are special people. And um, and I want to be part of that. And and even I, you know, like I said, I went to that talk and he made me cry like a baby. And, you know, nobody's ever been able to do that before. Just all these little things kind of add up. And then they do something um, which I think is very, um, it's, it's common. I, later on, I found out it's common with a lot of, uh, I, I, I know we're, the, the terms are a little uh, difficult, but cult with cults is love bombing. This idea that you show so much love to the person, it just wins them over. And so what happened was I, I've already coming, coming out of this group that I'd been in for 10 years. That's already, you know, an uh, issue for me. And, um, I'm looking for something on top of that. We end up having a baby who uh, passes away at 19 days old mm. uh, from a um, genetic disorder, and that was our, th our third ba baby. And so when that happens, that of course puts me in a very vulnerable state. And then they swoop in and help me out like quite a bit. They and they really did. Like they they helped me get through it. They they would say like, look, this is a this is everybody has a test, and and this might be your test. And those things like really made me feel better at, at a very difficult point in my life. So they did all those things, and 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 they really did help me a lot. And then what that what that did to me was it just made me trust them, and that's really key, because. All this stuff, the credibility, the trust, you know, these good experiences, the good feelings, all that's leading to is a point where um, I, I am comfortable saying, I'm ready to just submit myself to you. And that's another concept that I learned about, which was that you should be in the hands of your sheikh, just like a dead body is in the hands of a person washing, you know, like doing ghusl, like washing the dead body. Meaning that you are dirty with sin, somebody has to wash you. But you can't be fighting them with them while they're washing you. You just have to just relax and do nothing, basically. Let them do whatever they have to do to wash you. So that's kind of the the, the, the mindset. Mm. Which, as, as you said, like in my his uh, Tahir days, like I would have never accepted something like that. But after all this prep, like I mentioned, um, it got me to the point that I was... I, I was willing to accept that. Now, of course, they always give disclaimers. No, we don't mean submission like you submit to Allah. I can't go against the Sharia and all those types of things. But, but just even saying something like that to a Muslim, like it's a, it's a, it's a totally different mindset now, you yeah. know. So, so mm -hmm. I, I want to add again for the sake of like defining certain terms. You mentioned baya and you mentioned Khalifa. So. One of the terms relates to the hierarchy within a Sufi order. So maybe talk a little bit about that, just right. And then what is baya and, and what does that mean? Like, where are you at now, you know, again, in your journey? And then what does baya do necessarily? 
Sure, yeah, that's, that's great. So the Khalifa just means representative. So you have the, the structure is you have the main sheikh at the top, and then that main sheikh has a bunch of representatives, and they're and they're refers to, to referred to as Khalifas or Khulifa, plural. Um, and then each one of those um, Khalifas has their own set of students that they work with day to day. So in this case, this sheikh was so popular and famous, he had like probably in the hundreds of thousands of students, I think. That's what they used to say. And so it wouldn't be practical for him to deal one-on-one -on -one with each student. So he would have khalifas, his many khalifas, deal with the specific students and kind of get them up to a certain level. The idea was once the student is, is at that spiritual level, then they can hand them off to the, to the main sheikh and then he can work with them. So it's really hierarchical. Very much so. And, and, and I can't help but see parallels to, like, say, the Catholic Church. Yeah, I'm sure right? it's very Because similar. you have the Pope and then you have arch, archbishops who, as far as, like, and it's very regional and it's, like, there's a whole, you know, mechanism behind it. And I, and I don't know if, if it's regional so much. Um, but, and, and also I think it's, it's important for listeners who maybe come or, you know, are familiar with other Sufi Torikas, um, like what you call a Khalifa or like what the Naqshbandis refer to as a Khalifa, other schools may, or other, uh, orders may call a, um, a, 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 a Muqaddim. Muqaddim, I've heard so, of that. So it's a very yes. similar term. Same idea. I think. Yeah, same idea. Right. right. Exa it, in fact, exactly the same ideas. Right. Um, and then you have Khadims who are more like servants or sort of the first among equals. They're sort of the office manager operational managers exactly. logistics um, but as far as the actual spiritual local master is concerned that's the muqaddim or the khalifa in your case yeah right so this yes. khalifa then in chicago uh, you, you said not equally charismatic but nonetheless he's an impressive person i mean he's, he's very a, impressive hafiz of quran he's he's not hafiz okay, but, but he's a very he's learned a doctor so yeah. actually that's another important thing about right. both of them they're both professionals so the the sheikh is an engineer and a project manager by profession. So then that would be over because I'm just like, oh, wow, he actually understands like normal worldly things also. And he's religious. Yeah. And then the Khalifa is a is a doctor, medical doctor. So then and are I, you already a, a, like a tech professional at this point as well? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. I, I, I worked as a, um, as a programmer hmm. in, in healthcare. That's got to have some appeal. Yeah. Oh sure. no, it, it totally did. And I think I think people who come from professional backgrounds are like, oh, like I can I can actually connect with this person. It's not going to be like a Molly, for example, who just grew up in mother's son doesn't any, understand anything about the you know the worldly issues. Let's just say. Right. So that was so, very appealing. So the Khalifa is a, is a practicing physician. Correct. Right. right. And uh, and so yeah. So then uh, tell us more about that relationship, and you know, eventually. Yeah. What, yeah. what propels, you know, the, the next step. Yeah. So, so what happens is that he, the Khalifa in particular helped me so much with, at this point, I'm like having like, um, a lot of direct interaction with him through email, through phone calls, any problems I've, I'm having, I go to him and then he helps me with it in particular. Anytime I had an argument with my wife or, or anything like that, I would go to him and he would, um, and he would just tell us what to do. And it made my life very simple because I didn't have to really think about anything. And there was no like processing at all, really. We would just tell him what the argument was about. And he would say, okay, do this, do that, whatever. And most of the time he would side with my wife, which is probably <laughs> probably appropriate. Um, but it did make my life very simple. And so through that and also through the whole thing with the, the baby passing away, um, they just really gained my, uh, my confidence and my trust. And... So I got to a point where I just wanted to move to Chicago to be with him. Um, I'd made a few trips by that point to Chicago. He would have like a yearly itikaf gathering um, in, in one of the Chicago uh, masjids. And I loved it. Like it was the same kind of like, you know, get together and we're all doing dua and crying together and that kind of stuff. I don't know why I was so like obsessed with crying all are the, the time. Are the tears but. regularly flowing now? <laughs> I mean, that's a funny thing. It, it Like as much as I thought that, that, you know, going to Chicago would, would, I would just always be having these spiritual experiences. Yeah. It wasn't actually like that. Yeah. They're just these kind of sporadic um, events. So anyway, um, so I start badgering my wife, hey, let's move to Chicago, let's move to Chicago. And she, she's kind of like thinking about it. But once the baby passes away, mm. she gets to, she told me this later on. She was just, she was just so sort of numb by that experience that she was like, I don't even care. Let's go wherever you want. So I was like, all right, let's do it. Let's go to Chicago. So, so we did that. 
so we 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 um, packed everything up. I got a job out there, um, and we moved to Chicago, and that was in uh, 2007. And um, you know, we were there for a total of 11 years, and like our life basically just revolved around that Khalifa. We we would see him either once a week or twice a week, if you can imagine. Like every single week was like that. Unless we were traveling or he was traveling or something, which was which was rare. So a ton of interaction. And the group of students that was there, um, that became our social circle. We didn't really have much family out there. Um, we, we, and, and we didn't have any existing friends out there from before. But his students became our friends. And good people, very nice people, very sweet, very hospitable. And so... Um, for, for years and years, like that was it. They, they became like our family. Yeah. I was going to say yeah. more so than friends, more yeah. like family, really exactly. the way you're describing it. Yep. Yep. And, um, so once we got there and I was living there, that's around, well, it wasn't exactly that, but let's just say once I gave Bea, uh, oh, I, I never defined it for you. So Bea is oath of allegiance. So that's just the formal process of becoming a student of the, uh, of the sheikh. Um, and so in my case, it was a little, this gets a little technical, but my Bea was with uh, the, the Sheikh in Pakistan, but my day-to-day -day interaction, my training was through the Khalifa in mm -hmm. Chicago. So which is why even though I didn't have Bea directly with him, I interacted with him a lot. Are, are you able to directly access the Sheikh? Not really. Okay. Okay, because again, if there's hundreds of thousands of muids, yeah. it's just logistically impossible. And is yeah. the Khalifa taking bayah from anyone at this point, or are he you is. pretty much the norm? No, he he is from other people. Oh, okay. I think because I mean he's he's about a year older than me, mm. so I don't know if that's the reason or whatever the reason. He advised me specifically. He said you should give your bayah to the okay. sheikh, not to me, because your chain. The way he described it was your chain will be shorter to the prophet's mm. home, right? Because there's a whole thing about the chain mm -hmm. and all that. Um, so yeah, so even though mine wasn't, most of the other people I was interacting with, their bea was directly with the Khalifa. So that's a good point. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> so I have, I have so much to like ask you, but, but, but I don't want to jump the gun either. So, um, I, I guess as you reflect back on it now, right, to, to give up that level of agency and, 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 you know, I, I identity maybe that's not the best word but autonomy if you will good. even yeah right that you're sort of placing at the foot of the sheikh or the foot of the khalifa like i guess how, how does that become so easy how does that become so second nature to someone who like you said i mean you know you would have normally rejected like your gut instinct five years before that or maybe 10 years before that certainly would have been to reject it that's like no way, man. That's this, this. This sounds like a cult. Well, it sounds like yeah. it's so, the equivalent of like falling in love, right? You basically yes. like fall in oh, love with yes. the shit oh, in a non so... non sexualized way, but right, no, right, no, you no, fall no. in love with a person. Absolutely. In yeah. fact, I think you're spot on, Omar, because even the experts who study and talk about cults, often the metaphor that's used or the analogy used is is to like a toxic relationship or a divorce or you know or, or an abusive relationship or the on the flip side like that initial period of the honeymoon period and an intense love and, and longing and belonging to your, you know, to the person you're in love with. So, so yeah, very, I mean, I think it's, it's a very spot on analogy. Yeah. I agree 100%. And, and I think, um, in fact, it reminds me of a hadith of the Prophet mm. your love of something makes you blind and deaf. So your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should ideally make you blind and deaf to dunya and distractions. But flip side, your love of Sheikh will make you blind and deaf to to their faults yeah. mm -hmm. you know and i think that's exactly what happened i think i fell in love with them so and that's why i mentioned the trust thing in the beginning building that trust gaining that confidence that was the first step like I, that had to happen for me to be open to what they were teaching right but once i did that and then and i exposed myself and then they do this love bombing thing like i said because remember like i'm i'm in pain i'm vulnerable and then they're giving me a ton of attention. Like he's he's like totally into my problems. He's listening to everything. He's giving me good like what I thought was good advice. I'm following it, and, and I'm happy now. So that that's exactly what happened. That that relationship was built, but but that's all based on the fact. Like to, to answer your question, on this idea of nispa, mm. because we're so 
if I hadn't accepted that they have this special connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like, none of it would make sense. I'm going into it because I'm I'm thinking and believing that these guys really do have this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's special and that you know only their shaykh could have connected them. And that's what the model is too, by the way. The whole the whole thing supposedly is to take the murid and connect them to Allah. That's what every murid's goal is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. But you can only do that if if the murid does their lessons and they clean their filthy heart and they obey the sheikh and do all those things. And then the sheikh somehow magically knows when you're ready and then connects you. Mm. So what are, what are some examples of things that you believed the sheikh was doing that were like unordinary, ab- above and beyond what's normal for a, a learned person? I think it's a great question. I, I, I would love to sort of frame the conversation moving forward. Um, with sort of some of the, like the research that I uncovered while I was sort of like, you know, trying to prepare for this episode, because I think we, and we've skirted around it, but I think it's, I think we can safely use the word cult. And the reason I say that is because, you know, one of the sort of, the, the, there's like salient features that characterize these religious groups or, and, and make them more than just a regular sort of group or community and into cult status. And, and, and there's really sort of, it, it sort of coalesces around four main points. One is authoritarian control, right? So like cultism hinges on encouraging maximum dependency uh, of, to the community and to the norms of that community. So authoritarian control extremist beliefs so beliefs that are and 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 you know again that's from, that obviously is a secular kind of frame to look at it but i think it dovetails very nicely to omar's point because right like you've already talked about certain miracles you know more jazat karamat that are you know that, that you've witnessed or that are attributed to the sheikh so you know we can maybe loosely say okay you've got some extremist beliefs here that are you know like like to omar's question isolation from society and we can certainly yep. maybe talk about that sure. and he did right. you're, you're talking about this has become your family at this point supersedes absolutely. your other family and friends yeah, yeah right right absolutely and then last but not least veneration of a single individual yeah yeah. Which you did, you did right. take the bayah, ba- 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 right? With the one. Oh, well, bayah yeah. is bayah, but I mean veneration, where no, totally. the, the 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 central feature of the of what binds the group together is the fact that you are all murids of this great sheikh, yep. and mm-hmm. the great sheikh is to be thanked, and he is a gift from Allah, and and Absolutely. and even nisba, right? Yeah. The idea of nisba is there's something. You know, he and I think you. I, I heard you talk about this on one of your other podcasts or talks you've done in this subject. Mm-hmm. You differentiate between like they'd be very careful not to say that the sheikh is ma'asum, correct? Is infallible, right? And that we like to go back to my analogy of the Catholics. They believe the Pope is infallible. Cool. Like, so there's going to be none of that that's going to automatically raise red flags to you. Exactly. Whoa, 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 ma'asum. Like only you know the the only asma that we know is to the, of the prophets. Exactly. Well, only the prophets well, are ma'asum. But but the sheikh is not ma'asum, but he's mahfuz. Exactly. Yeah, but so, what's interesting is right. the, it's what you what I'm here what I heard from you is you you don't have day-to-day direct access to the sheikh. So no. there there is a bit of distance which which essentially is like a shield or a blinder Very from true. you seeing the day-to-day normal human being, right? So yeah. then that almost further makes you venerate them. Excellent point. Yeah. 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 No, that's all true. Yep. Right. That's, so when, uh, that's when, all how it works. So, yeah. but, but I, I, I'd love for you to answer Omar's question. Yeah. Though. I think that was a really important question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's always stories about like, um, the Sheikh had a dream about such and such. So for example, their, um, clothing that they wore in the group is very distinct. Like, especially in Chicago, like everybody know, if you see that shirt, then wearing that shirt right now, it's that you're, you're part of that group. And the story behind it is that the sheikh supposedly had this dream, and I don't know if he claims that he saw the Prophet Sallallahu or not, but some kind of dream, and in that dream, he learns that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wore this very specific type of shirt, so then he goes to a tailor and then describes the, that shirt to the tailor, and then the tailor, you know, sews it up that way, and then everybody gets the idea, like, this is the, the Sunob shirt or whatever, something like that. Um, so that's one example, or... Um, like, um, they might just say like that the, the sheikh ha- has dreams about, um, just knowing certain things are going on. Oh, he has a whole book about actually about his trip to, um, to, uh, to Russia. Where does he go exactly? I want to say like, um, central Asia area. Yeah. And in it, 
the whole the, the 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 book describes how he goes to Central Asia and basically gets people into the uh, into the tariqa. All these people are giving him bail left and right. That's kind of the book, but it's all built on he had a dream in which I think he claims that the Prophet <coughs> came to him, told him to do that, right? So then, um, so that's another thing is it just adds again to his credibility that like he's this special person and has a special knowledge about things and gets inspired by things. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. I'm trying to think of other miracles. Oh, one of his most famous things is uh, what, this term they call tawajjah, which means attention. So one of my friends said he went to to um, a gathering uh, with the same sheikh from Pakistan, and people were kind of sitting in a semicircle around him. And so something somebody, one of his students said, can you give us tawajjah, can you give us attention? And when they say attention, they, it's like a very specific thing that they do. Like the sheikh, like focuses his heart on your heart, something along those lines, right? And so my friend said, I, I guess he was—I don't know if he was pointing his face at each person or somehow he knew who he was giving the wajah to. As he went through and was giving the wajah to people, people would just start crying or just reacting to it. So he felt like it was this palpable thing, mm. you know, the wajah that you're giving. And he said, like, he, I think he even told me that um, when it got to him, it happened to him too. Right, so yeah. it was like one of those no, hypnosis and, and courses, or, or that's what something I'm saying. Like I've that. heard you describe it. I mean, it's no, it, yeah. it's 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 like the Pentecostals and speaking in tongues, there you and, go. and and uh, the Holy Spirit, exactly. Right, that that right, and people convulse and people roll around and people have like yeah. uh, ecstatic experiences. Right, so that was very much, I think, part of the vernacular. Yeah, like you, you know, people had these experiences in the presence of the sheikh where they felt the nisbah go through them and right. I mean, yeah, totally. And you totally. even had retreats where certain individuals were recognized yep. as having it or not having it. Yeah. Right. So there's also, oh, that, it was a whole formal process. Actually, see, that's what I mean. Yeah. So these kind of strange rituals where yep. people are selected or elected. Exactly. Right? So, How about okay. um, cases? Did you hear about uh, where the sheikh could like, look at you and kind of see through right. like oh that was understood yeah. that, everybody that was, just understood that that's what he was knew going your on. he knew your condition he yeah. knew your state condition yeah he yeah. knew exactly what you needed to work on yeah that yeah, was yeah, like yeah. a that's like a bare that basic like, that's a given yeah, no yeah. kidding that's a yeah. given okay right. he wouldn't be a sheikh worth his <laughs> right his salt if you if you right. didn't if you couldn't produce so, that so that's very yeah. so so yeah and and that's my reason for for sort of raising some of this research here because i find it really like i said very uh, informative to what you're exactly what you're describing. So I think that, you know, whatever shyness or hesitation we have to use maybe loaded terms like cult, I think we can dispense with because you see it. Fits it, it, it fits clearly, right, it. Right, right, exactly. So what are some of the first kind of warning signs where the honeymoon starts to end and yeah. the, the next okay. phase begins? Well, I want to, uh, sorry, and I, that's a really important, I mean, I, we certainly have to talk about that. But what about like, uh, you know, because again, other salient features are, and you've already kind of alluded to it, where uh, consulting experts outside of the, uh, yes. outside of the order is frowned upon. I was, oh, I so, that, yeah. right. If you're having professional problems, if you're having, like you even joke about what kind of haircut to get. So like, don't yeah. even talk to your barber. He told me what haircut to get. <laughs> right. So I don't mean to I mean, laugh. I, asked I don't mean to laugh, to but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's funny. I mean, no, but, no. but that's, that, but yeah. it kind of shows you what state right. I was in. So consulting expertise from outside of the, outside of the organization is frowned upon, is discouraged. And no, no, I would say yeah. further than that, okay. he, he cut us off. He told us mm. point blank, don't, re you don't read the news. You don't um, go study with other scholars. You don't even listen to their CDs or anything. You only study either with me, you learn from me, or your people I tell you that's okay to study How are you from. functioning? Like with this mentality, are you able to just go to work and kind of shut it off for eight hours a day? And then like, because work, there's a social component to work. There's a, I'm curious. No, how, he how... himself worked. So that was never an issue. So I, I knew just by seeing him that he was okay with stuff like that. Okay. You just go to work, you do what you got to do. And then, but then everything outside of work though, is okay. like just right. So in your line. heart is with the sheikh and, exactly. the, and the and the group, but you're you're just kind of doing work as a, as work. It's like a thing you have to yeah. do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, I wanted to bring up something that I mentioned at the outset, and I think it's a fascinating sort of case study. Um, you know, that is outside of our faith tradition, so it's not you know a Muslim organization. Um, the name of the the name of the cult was Nexium, and it was uh, the their charismatic leader was you know. Uh, a man by the name of Keith Rainier, um, based in Albany, New York. Um, and basically, 
the selling point was that he told his disciples that they were uh, all reincarnates of uh, high-ranking Nazis in their former lives, and they were being born again. And what he presented them was a way of sort of cleansing um, themselves. So was this a supremacist group? No, Why no, no, no. they have an appeal to Nazi? Oh, uh, no, and it was, it, no, it was not a supremacist Strange. group whatsoever. Okay. But it was like you were, for, like the Nazis were bad. You see oh. what I'm saying? So you have to cleanse yourself I because in your previous saying. life you were a Nazi. You something bad. Yeah. Okay. And then he specifically targeted, um, and there was a whole process of grooming, of targeting, grooming women to essentially become his sex slaves. And there was an inner circle known as DOS, D-O-S, um, and that's where Allison Mack, who was the Smallville actress, where she played a part in basically recruiting these young women to become a part of this DOS. And DOS essentially meant that you belonged to Keith and, you know, you essentially were Keith's sex slave. Um, but again, all of that was done within this sort of overarching way of bettering yourself and cleansing yourself of you know, the sins of your previous life, essentially. Um, but anyway, I raised that, and, and, and there's a fascinating documentary, which I have not watched. However, it's called The Vow. It's on HBO. Um, and interestingly enough, it's directed by an Arab-American uh, film director, J uh, Jehane Nujaim, I believe is her name. Um, she's born to Lebanese father, American mother. She was raised in Kuwait and Cairo. So she's the director. Um, and uh, I know they just finished uh, season one. Now they started season two, which goes into the uh, sort of leg the legal trials and so on that have now come about because of the allegations against Keith. Um, uh, so anyway, um, I, I, I raise all of that because, again, you know, one of the things that we see within this particular cult also is, again, you have the sort of charismatic leader yep. uh, at the center. Um, and he sort of positioned himself as being highly enlightened, right? Absolutely. Again, you see the parallels. Uh, he was an ethical leader. And that veneration and honoring him, the cult leader, was how you basically, and, and seeking the validation of the leader was how you essentially, you know, uh, got to a better place, yep. um, you know, personally. Um, and then he was also a genius at multi-level marketing, right? We took like pyramid schemes. So for example, you know, the people who were part of his DOS, which was essentially like this pyramid scheme, because every member of the DOS, every young lady who was part of that uh, inner circle had to recruit six other women. And so, you know, and, and, and they, uh, you know, uh, rose ranks within the organization by recruiting people. So very wow. much similar to recruitment and so on. Um, and then at the very sort of, you know, uh, another sort of part of what comes out about Nexium is that, you know, is misogyny where, you know, then, you know, he, he, he believed and, and, and this is what he told his female disciples that men were by nature polygamous or sorry, polyamorous. So having multiple lovers and, and mates and women were by their nature monogamous. So whatever occurred between him and these disciples, female disciples was all part of the sort of natural order of things because men are men and women are women. And I raise that again because I know kind of where our conversation is going to be headed. Right. Um, and so I kind of wanted to just kind of pinpoint that as well. But yep. um, anyway, so as I guess you're responding, um, you know, and, and, I'll, and I'll try to throw in other things that, that we, you know, that, that I sort of gleaned from my research that I did. Um, but I, yeah, I, I'd love to kind of, for you to frame, you know, all of this with some of the research that's out there as well. So, sure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of parallels and that's what I've noticed too, is, is this very strange that a, a Muslim Sufi group would have so many parallels with these, um, non-Muslim groups, yeah. um, cults. I mean, I think everybody would generally probably agree that they would yeah. fit some kind of definition of, of a cult. Um, and yeah, you have that, you know, you have a charismatic leader, you have somebody in, um, who, who personalities at the center of the group. Um, and then you have, um, what was the second thing that you mentioned? Um, well, like veneration of the leader and veneration oh, yes. and, and seeking the validation of yes. the, of the leader. So that's, that's huge. So that was a really, really big part of the, of, of the, 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 this group that I was with, uh, mm -hmm. with the Sheikh and the Khalifa both, which was that. There's so, there there is an expectation of this extreme amount of expect, uh, respect, 
So not just physical in terms of like if they're walking, you walk behind them, you don't really look them in the eye and all that kind of stuff. It's beyond that. They'll say you don't even have a negative thought about your sheikh because if you do that, you won't be able to benefit. Mm. And so that's what I was referring to about the love bombing thing at the beginning. It's part of like how you pull people in or how they pull people in because obviously, you know, you're vulnerable, you're looking for something and then they're giving you all this attention. And so you're always craving that and you're craving their love. And so your fear all the time is, is that love going to diminish? And it's so extreme that like, you know, like if the sheikh even frowned or just looked away slightly, it would just like somebody like me, it would just tear me up. I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's the, that's the level that we were at. That you know that, that we were just so utterly dependent um, on the sheikh uh, decision making. Very early on, I was severely scolded for making a, a decision. Ironically, I had consulted the sheikh about it, the main sheikh, and he actually is the one that told me to. to it was about go, moving to the Middle East. Remember, I was saying about how like there was all that tension mm -hmm. because of nine eleven and stuff like that. And he said, "Yeah, you just you know move to uh, Sharjah specifically is what he told me." And then I mentioned it to the Khalifa in Chicago um, later on, just in passing, actually, because I just thought, okay, it's the Khalifa's sheikh who told me to do this, make this move. So, of course, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. He just blew up. He was like, you're sitting there by yourself making decisions on your own. You're not going anywhere. You need to come here and help me, and that kind of stuff. Mm. And I was just like, I literally just told you that it was your sheikh or our sheikh who said to go there. And then what I, but what I got from it was like, oh, what he's trying to tell me is don't ever make decisions without going through me. Got it. See, and, and another telltale sign of a cult and something we haven't named per se is this idea of a coercive control. Yeah. So whether it's by outright threats and humiliation, but, but sometimes it could be like, like kind of what you're describing, which is it's, you know, undesirable, frowned upon, yeah. you know, says something negative about you when you don't make decisions that are based on explicit guidance from the leadership. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So yeah. that level of course of control was there. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, so I guess you were, you know, I think Omar asked you about the sort of early telltale signs, but I think before you wanted, you know, before you wanted to address that, you had mentioned, um, off air, how you wanted to kind of talk about what were the, some of those control mechanisms within the organization, right? We're talking about course yeah. of control. Yep. So, you know, they're using scripture. They're using, you know, they're using, they're, they're calling to authority that you recognize. Right. Right. They're not, they're not saying something that is outside of tradition. They're in fact using, abusing, we, abusing we, we, we would say, okay. abusing uh, tradition, scripture even, to justify uh, what is occurring. And then not only that, but then to also validate what they're doing. So Absolutely. maybe talk a little bit about how that, how now you, when you think back to it, yeah. you know, how you identify. And I think that'll lead directly to Omer's questions, right? About, yeah. or Omer's question about the cracks. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So, yeah. So some of the things kind of funny, you're, you're right that, that a lot of it was, was sort of, um, couched in scripture, but some of it was not. And, it, and the reason it didn't need to be was because of going back to the whole idea of nispa and miracles and stuff. Thank it's you. because anything they do is like, oh, that's from, that's from the sheikh. He gets ilham and he, and he has connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's almost like, uh, uh, in fact, it's very much so the, the, the students think of the sheikh as being like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a sense. And they won't say that explicitly. And they think of it that way. And they think of themselves as being like Sahaba in relation to the sheikh. And they they say that explicitly. I mean, that's not like a, like there, there's, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. I said one time when, I, this is way later when I was leaving and I was criticizing the group and saying, oh, there's like a cult. And then multiple members came to me and said, well, if you have a problem with, with how we're treating the sheikh, then you should have a problem with how the Sahaba tr treated the Prophet mm. So in their minds, it's all fine because it's the same relationship. Wow, you know, which is ridiculous, but and 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 that's why I like I mentioned scripture because uh, or scriptural sources or you know things yeah. from our tradition because, and I wrestle with this too because on the one hand, belief in metaphysics, metaphysical reality, belief in supra rational, meaning things that are beyond our rational capability of understanding, 
otherworldly, if you will. Uh, I think Omar t- mentioned something like out of the ordinary stuff, right? Uh, we believe in that. We believe exactly. in the ghayb. We believe in ilham. Absolutely. Like you mentioned the word ilham, right. which is this sort of intuitive nature. Uh, we believe in we believe in the entirety of the, the sort of the the jelly dimension, as mm-hmm. you know, using the language of Sufism describes. So, um, so on the one hand, it almost lends itself to. It doesn't lend itself to abuse, but it can easily be be be, yeah. be misused Sets or abused. The stage. It set, if you're if the intention is bad, it's setting the stage for abuse, right? Right. Be, it's putting the person in that mind frame to let their guard down or to think that something illogical could, in fact, be logical. That's right. Well, I, I would almost frame it a, a different way. I I, I agree with you. I, yeah. I think that's okay. true, but I don't want to um, give. Uh, those terms a bad name or no. even Sufism a bad name because if you notice like Nexium, Nexium probably did that kind of thing other groups did that kind of thing and it's always this callback to like the, the leader has a special knowledge of something right. now in our case of course they'll just immediately abuse Islamic terms but other groups are not even Muslim. They don't have those terms, but they have other ways that they do it. That's right. So I think it's just sort of like you get yeah. these, you know, narcissistic personalities and they just take whatever tools they have available to them and they bend them towards um, manipulation. Right, right. And so like, yeah. And I think that's what Omar was saying too. Like, I think, I think there's a sort of, you know, like the soil is ripe in yeah. this, in, in the sense that, you know, when you want to go down the path of Saluk, you know, down the spiritual path, you know, the, 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 these type of terms, this understanding is embedded. Like you have to totally. recognize that. So, and recognize the reality of that, reality of those things, the validity of those things, um, you know, the the, uh, authorita- the authoritative nature of those things. But at the same time, the, those those very things can then be misused and yeah, misapplied, they can be abused, uh, and they can be abused exactly. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, so, you, so there was a, there was a lot of that. Like I think you were, I, I cut exactly. you off because you were talking about this idea again of nispa, right? Yeah, and you also mentioned the wajjo, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, like these are things that cannot be quantified, exactly. Right? They and, and not only that, they they also are supra rational. They're yep. beyond our rational understanding of things, yet there is a suspension of, you know, disbelief in that right. sense that, okay, well, I recognize that these things are valid and they're real, so perhaps the sheikh has it. Not perhaps, the, <laughs> like, it's, I mean, for the students. No, like, no. This is, you mean like when we're getting into yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly right. right. So, so I'm curious that then, you know, again, how are, like, what were some of those things that were used? You, yeah. Oh, what are those things? Yeah. So, um... I think we talked about a few of them about mm-hmm. like, yeah, the yeah. Um Oh, I, I remembered another one, which is that, in fact, somebody asked another Khalifa, a different Khalifa of the Sheikh one time, what are, what are some of the miracles of the Sheikh? Cause they knew that particular Khalifa had spent a lot of time with the Sheikh in person yeah. and just like really, you know, accompanied him for, for I think years. And he said his, um, his energy level, which is kind of weird. But within the group, there was this all. <laughs> there was always this um, idea of sleep very little because you're going to rest in the grave, and so the sheikh supposedly used to barely sleep each night. And, and maybe it's true. I don't know. Maybe, I don't have any reason to think it's not true. But he would barely sleep supposedly, and then he would just go on and do dawa and do whatever it is that they do. And so he considered that a miracle that a person can function like that. Um, so it's things like that. I don't know if that right. really answers. No, your no, question, it does. Yeah. Because, and again, see, like while you're saying that, I mean, I'm, there's so many instances through in, in Muslim lore, if you will, and Muslim tradition that come to mind where, you know, oh, such and such scholar, uh, you know, uh, he, for tw- 30 years, he prayed Fajr with the wudu of Isha, right? for example. Correct. You know, and things like that. So, yeah. or yes, you know, like even now, I, I know of certain mashayikh who it is claimed that they sleep two hours a night, one to two hours a night. Exactly, yeah. And that's the all they thing. need. Yeah. And, then, and yet they are traveling and they have all the energy right. in the world. So, and then also finally, the idea that if a person is a wali, Again, right? I'm yep. sure that was a term that was used. One hundred percent. Right. The Sheikh is yep. the Wali. He is a Wali. He is a he is a saint, essentially. 
and not just wali, but they have a term. Uh, I think they say wilayat khas or something because mm. they'll say every believer is a wali at some level. That's true. Well, because it says it right. It's uh, in the Quran. It right? says it in the Quran. Yeah, right. But then they're saying no. We're talking about different. Allahu wali wal ladina aman. Exactly. Like God is the right. So so yeah. The, so wilayat is everyone has wila a certain right. level of wilayat. Right. Interesting. So this is wilayatul khas. Right. Specific. Yeah. Interesting. So, so what I was saying about the wali, though, we believe that certain awliya or wali can perform karamat. Exactly. Right? We don't use the word. That's mo'ad. part it's, of our religion, right? It's I mean, aqidah. It's right. it's creed. Yeah. So 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 yeah. So see again, those things can then be manipulated yep. to uh, going to, with this idea of coercive control. Yeah. Right. Right. Yep. Um, so. I, I guess I, I you know I, I, and I and I know you still have some you know like I know you want to talk about some of the early cracks, but I guess I have a question for you at this point, as yeah. I'm sure you've done a great deal of introspection about what was it about you specifically, and you know um, and 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 what you recognized in some of you the other murids that made them and I and I apologize for using this word but susceptible to this type of uh, manipulation, if you will, right? Because yeah. one of the things that, again, the experts have sort of rejected is this idea of the brainwashing being used, like brainwashing occurs, but to use brainwashing as a defense, if you will, that, well, I was just simply brainwashed as a defense to, well, where you let go of your free will and your autonomy and your agency, um, you know, there's now sort of where experts are saying, well, it, there's something within the individual where the individual almost seeks out a level of autopilot, like where they want to give authority to someone else. So yeah. again, I'm not saying that that was you or that was the fellow oh, Murids. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that comment. Was... <laughs> and I, I know it's a tough question. It's a very no, personal question. No, I think it's a question. great question. Yeah. No, I, I think it's a really, really good question. I think it, it actually is not explored enough. So I'm really happy that you, you brought that up. Um, so there's a few things around that. One is that I can I think I can say generally based on my experience and, and my readings and, and talking to people. By the way, once I started openly talking about my experience online, a lot of people um, uh, DM me basically. They just privately message me and would tell me about their experiences. That's why I started realizing, oh my god, it's really not just me. It's just all over the world. Like this is a big thing. Yeah. So anyway, based on all that, I would say one basic thing is vulnerability. Something's happened in the person's life it's sort of tragic or traumatizing and and they're hurt they're 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 kind of broken inside and and they're looking for they're looking for something they're looking for some for some source of peace in their life that's at a base level and then i think people like that also are looking for some kind of love in a sense again not in a sexual way necessarily but just somebody um and in particular a father figure and that's just my personal experience and from talking to people um, I love my father, of course, but you know, he, he came as an immigrant. He didn't fully understand the society here. He certainly didn't understand what I was going through. And so there was a little, some level of, of tension there. And it, again, talking to other people, I found out that's a common thing. And so people are looking for a father figure and it's not an accident because these guys, the language that they use is always that I'm your spiritual father. Um, and, and that's how they frame it. And, you know, for somebody who's looking for that anyway, that's perfect. There's a perfect matchup now. You know, they come in and they fulfill that role as a, uh, as a father figure. Um, and so I think, I don't know if, that, if I answer your question, no. but I, I think those are the kind of the things, you know, the, the vulnerability, looking for, for somebody who's going to give them love and attention and that kind of thing, yeah. and then specifically looking for a father figure. Yeah, and, and you know, and I... And, by, by no means, I think it's, you know, should you see that as a pejorative or something negative about you or something, you know, yeah. like like as a flaw of, of yourself or uh, of the other uh, murids? Because, sure. you know, for example, there's another expert, you know, uh, psychologist who studied some of this, uh, Robert Lifton. And he says that there's a capacity of total submission that lurks in all of us. Mm -hmm. And it comes from childhood. Interesting. Because as young children, we place, there's a prolonged period of time in early, uh, in our early development where we have no choice but to attribute what he calls, quote unquote, exaggerated omnipotence mm -hmm. to our parents. Yes. So you, you bringing a, a father sense. figure is spot on yeah. because, yeah. you know, we're conditioned that way. It's in our DNA, mm -hmm. right? We're wired this way um, to place 
this idea of exaggerated omnipotence to people that we deem worthy. Um, and when we're young children, it's our parents. Right. But then later it becomes teachers, coaches, uh, you know, uh, maybe even employers. I don't know, you know, sure. like supervisors. In this case, yeah. a spiritual teacher. That totally yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So re re really fascinating that you, like, though, that you raised that. So, um, yeah, so now I guess finally <laughs> to answer Omer's question about the cracks. Oh, sorry. Yeah. There's was, there was oh, yeah. one more thing sorry. I wanted to mention. Yeah. No problem. Um, was the information control. That was also right. a huge aspect of it. And very early on, he let us know, do not read the news. No social media for sure. I mean, social media is considered like, you know, devil. Um, I know a lot of people don't like it for other reasons, but this was, this was different. This wasn't like, hey, it's going to, um, there's some social ills with it. This was like, no, practically, and he maybe he didn't say the word haram, but we treated it that way as if it's haram. Why is that? Um, why do you it, think that? Why do you think that is? The, now? Well, the way they framed it was always that it's all dis distraction from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Mm -hmm. We're like he's saying, I'm I'm putting in all this effort, and you're putting in effort as a murid to connect to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That's always supposedly the goal is is nispa. And to do that, there's so much work involved. And if now you go and read the news and your heart's going to be filled with filth and distractions, um, and that's going to, you know, you're not going to reach your goal. And what do you think is the hidden agenda, I guess? Is it just like why from, from if, 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 if assuming attentions are bad from the get go, why mm. would they not want you to have outside information? Oh, so what that does is it gives them complete control over you. Well, it's part of what gives them control over you because it's not just no news. It's also don't study with any other scholars. Mm. Don't read, their, don't listen to their lectures. Don't read their books. Don't listen to their CD. Back then, their CDs. Don't listen to their CDs. Nothing. We because we asked about that explicitly. And he's like, you study. I'm, I'm your teacher. And the example they would always give was, it would be. I think he would say, if you're a student at Stanford, you don't take classes at Berkeley. <laughs> and we'd say, well, of course not. Of course it, that makes sense. It almost feels sense. like they're controlling what you think about. Yes. So if you're not if you're not getting news from somewhere else, you're not even allowed to think about that external topic. Correct. They're feeding you what you should even th think about. Exactly. Not what to think, but what you should think even about. Yeah. Which exactly. again, right? There, like, uh, uh, there's a part of it that seems intuitive and that seems well like yeah that makes sense like right. you know i shouldn't you know spend a endless hours on social media that's i mean that's like bad thing i think sure. period um it, it, you shouldn't you know be you know um stressing out about world events that you have no control over here spend your time on something that's more meaningful something more meaningful to your own personal growth and you know, busy your time with this as opposed to busying your time with that so right. again on, on on its face it seems like seems very reasonable it seems very reasonable yeah. there you go not only reasonable right. but also like it makes sense for you to achieve your goals like if you're on the yeah. suluk if you're on the path then to spiritual enlightenment then certainly that makes sense right yeah, right. even, exactly. um, but it's very, you know, but it's, it is very subtle because what you're describing, um, you know, so for example, there was very recently, um, another spiritual leader, I'll just say that who was accused of impropriety and, and, and abuse, uh, not sexual, but there was sort of abusive and coercive practices occurring within uh, that organization and that, uh, that, uh, yeah, tariqa, if you will. Uh, I'll just say it was a shadly um, yeah, I don't, we don't need to name names again, but there it was also very subtle. It, what was initially began with this idea of, well, the Sheikh will give you all you need. Exactly. But then it became actively discouraging its followers from listening to Sheikh Hamza Yusuf because this is why. And then Dr. Omar, I mean, it was, these were named individuals, like don't listen to them. Um, you know, and, and so again, it, it be, whereas it begins as something almost benign, then it becomes very, as I said, kind of, um, there's a very active way of um, preventing you from going and listening to other people that you may seem and find very reasonable. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned Sheikh Hamza Yusuf because there's, a, there's an interesting story about that. So at one time I was sitting with, this, with the Khalifa from Chicago and there was one of his very high ranking students was there. So it was just the three of us sitting together. And um, the other student, by the way, is himself supposedly a scholar and 
I mean, he's a, by profession a, a, a medical doctor, but he went overseas as an adult and studied and whatever. He we always considered him very knowledgeable. So anyway, so it's me, the Khalifa, and, and this other um, high-ranking student of his. And so the student says to the Khalifa, he brings up Sheikh Hamza's name, and something about studying with him or some comment he made, or it, it, actually that wasn't even that, yeah. It was just some comment he made. And so the Khalifa's answer was very interesting. He said, you know, we're, um, he, he told this whole long story about how like there is a, there's a mother-sa in India, then somebody built, and one of the teachers left and built a, a, a competing mother-sa across the street. And then, but then the, the, the person running the first mother-sa said, no, we're all, we're all trying to move a mountain. So if he's just helping us, it's not a competition. The whole point was like, he, he, he's a scholar and he's also, you know, doing Islamic work. So, so far, so good, right? So far, so good. But then he says, but for us, we, we, we don't follow people who don't practice the outward of the sunnah. So in one sentence, he completely decimated his credibility, Sheikh Hamza's credibility, right. in a very slick way, because he first made it sound like we respect him, he's a scholar, and he's doing good work as well. But for us personally in the group, we, we don't take anything from him, because, again, he's not following the outward of the, the sunnah. The outward of the sunnah. Yeah, so remember these, he doesn't have a beard, yeah. oh, okay. uh, maybe dresses a certain way. Uh, maybe, exactly. I, I don't know if this is post 9-11. Oh, it is. So like showed up at the White House. I don't know, whatever, right? I mean, there's a lot of things people could criticize about Sheikh yeah. Hamza, or people have, I should say. Um, you know, um, but uh, yeah, and, then, and fascinating, right? So, so in one fell swoop, you know, you, 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 like you do the sort of standard pitch, which is, oh, we're all, you know, we're all uh, on the path and, we're, you know, he's just another person, a guide on the path to, well, you know, he's yeah. not really. Yeah. yeah. Right. So. Yeah, exactly. So I, I'm hoping it'll give you a yeah. sense of how slick this was, like, because it, in the end, you're right, it's, it's really subtle because what you end up with after all these years is you, you're, you, you don't have any chance of getting any opposing view. Hmm. Um, all you get in. is they're that, locking you in. They're, they're locking you in completely right. locked in. That's right. You know, I mean, mental prison. and again, you know, I don't question people's intentions. So, like, you know, go, going back to the example I was giving of the Shadley order, right? That has some, you know, some recent things come out about it. Uh, you know, initially, like for so the the uh, I know the issue of qibla became very very oh, kind of that. a very contentious is issue because certain people believed you prayed southeast, certain people said no, you you, you the qibla is northeast. And it, initially it was like, okay, well, you know what? At the end of the day, this is, you know, this is ikhtilaf. There's a difference of opinion. We're not here to say you can't pray behind certain individuals, so on and so forth. Well, but then, you know, there's an entire book that comes out written yeah. by the sheikh that basically presents the argument that you have to pray, you know, facing this direction and any other direction and any other opinion is sort of invalid. So again, I'm not saying that that was the intent behind the book. But it furthers this idea of isolating the individual yeah. from any other source of information. And isolating knowledge. and discrediting. There you go. Right. The people who don't agree with them. Yeah. 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 Fascinating. Right. Um, so, so then, um, so everything's going, going, going well. I think you're yeah. 11 years into this organization now, or you, you've been living in Chicago. I, that's right. Yeah. yeah. 11 years in. in. That's yeah. right. What are some of the initial sort of cracks that you begin to see? So and how and how yeah. because if yeah. you're so if you're mm -hmm. so locked in, like yeah. how does that even start getting unraveled? Yeah, that that's great way you, you you put that question because that that is how it was. I was totally locked in, going 100 miles per hour in this thing. Didn't know like all the things I mentioned. I think any sane person would have noticed it, but we were you know like I described, we, we were slowly uh, kind of manipulated in, into this mindset, and so uh, 11 years into the tariqa. Um, what was it? Nine years into our our stay in Chicago, at that point, we're going full speed ahead. Like I'm happy with whatever. I mean, I I, I we had issues. Um, that's a whole separate discussion. But as far as the, the my relationship with the sheikh, no problems whatsoever. Like I loved it. Out of the blue, my wife gets a phone call from the student of a, a different Khalifa of the same sheikh. So right, so mm -hmm. you got the sheikh at the top. You got all these different khalifas. Yeah. So we're we're of course um, connected to the one in Chicago. She gets a phone call from a different khalifa who I think at that time was based out of Pakistan. Mm. And then the student says to my wife, um, 
she basically just tells my wife that guess what you know your sheikh and um uh, sorry your your khalifa that you work with and the khalifa I work with they're both leaving the sheikh and for us it was just unimaginable like just the idea of that because there because the khalifa is whenever they're giving talks almost always the, 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 one of the main things they'll bring up is how wonderful the sheikh is mm-hmm. you know so it was just totally unimaginable to us so my wife calls me at work she tells me um, she got this weird phone call, and I'm like, it doesn't even make sense. Like, that's not, there's no way. It's impossible that that could have happened, that, you know, that they could have left him. So I, as with everything, I immediately contact the, the Khalifa and ask him about it. And then he's, he's basically really upset that I even called him or asked him about any, any of this. Were you going to say something? Okay. Or he was going to, well, that I was going to, that I'm even asking about it or bringing it up. And he kept saying, like, how do you know about this? And why are people talking about this and stuff? So well, I found out later on, basically, it had just happened. Whatever this, you know, split was had just happened. And he was shocked that I knew about it. I kept telling him, I don't know, like, this person just called my wife. You know, mm-hmm. I, I have no idea. Like, well, I don't know why you're, you know, getting upset with me. I didn't say that, but I was, yeah. that's what I was wondering. So he tells me that. Yes, it's true. Um, I've, I've left him, um, but don't talk about it to anybody. Don't ask questions. Don't dig. It's the kind of thing that if you find out, it's going to mess up your iman. And he said, just wait. I'm going to give everybody some options. And he just kind of leaves it at that. Okay. Now, my mind's going crazy because I'm like, what in the world? Like, how could this happen? Because th- that doesn't sound to me like an outright cover up. Right? right, because I mean, I've seen outright cover up. So for me, this is like, well, I'm yes, I'm. It's it's true. I'm departing. I'm leaving the sheikh yeah. for X Y Z reasons. Right. Uh, and and uh, uh, but at the same time, don't dig. Don't ask questions. Don't worry about what those X Y Z reasons are. Right. And I'm going to give uh, you know the people who are under me options to pursue. Yep. Like so. That's the, so. I, I guess I'm curious. So like, why not either a full fledged cover up or just letting you know that, okay, this is what I've been covered. This is what I've found out. And based on this, I'm leaving. So why this kind of really... That's what nobody could figure out okay. until this day. To this day. Yeah. At least I don't know. Yeah. I don't know anybody that knows. Yeah. And it was really weird. Because um, then what happened was I went for months waiting for him to give these so-called options. Months. Months, yeah. Okay. I would go, I mean, as it is, we were seeing him every week or twice a week sometimes, That's depending right. on what the event was. And now I can't even focus on what he's talking about. I'm just so like, what in the world is so bad that right. he had to leave him? And when is he going to address it? He's yeah. just acting like nothing even happened. Like if I hadn't called him, I wouldn't have any idea. He, he was just, like I said, acting like everything was fine. He, is he still singing the praises publicly of the sheikh? No. Okay. So what happened was later on, he, uh, okay, so so that's a good point. So what he did was he quietly just stopped making references um, to the sheikh. And he, from his website, took down any references to the sheikh, just quietly. They just did it. And um, in fact, so much so, I think even the lectures where he had made references to the sheikh, he put pulled down those specific lectures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No big announcement, no nothing. They just disappeared. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what's going, what is going, I mean, I'm curious, <laughs> yeah. what is going on? Yeah, yeah. So then, yeah. So I, it was killing me. My mind's going berserk because I'm just like, what happened here? I finally did start asking around uh, uh, my friends who were Marines. Um, and um, finally, one of my friends said, yeah, he, here's what, here's what happened. That he before, has been accused. Sorry, sorry before you, because I know exactly what you're going to say. Sure, sure. I think it's important, and I'm sorry to do this to the listeners, but I think it's important to kind of tell us kind of the social dynamic that's in place, right? Because I, I, I'm, I'm familiar with some of the people that are involved, and so I know that, for example, gender mixing is oh, yes, right. highly forbidden. Correct. There's no gender mixing going on. All of their, most of their gatherings are strict barda, strict partition, yeah. women all cover, all of that kind of stuff, right? Is, is that yeah, true? Is that exactly a fair right. assessment? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so that. Yeah. So then, my question then is like, how, how do some of the female murid, muridas, if you will, um, or the wives of murids, then access the sheikh or the khalifa if there's this sort of very strict barda that's observed? Yeah. Or is so, there any of that going on? N- no, there is. So with the khalifa, at least, it would be either through email or like a conference call or something. Like in my case, he would almost always say, do a conference call where you're on the call and your wife together so that it wouldn't just be him. Although I think he did want, w- would sometimes take okay. just calls like that. Got it. But no, you're right. That is a really important part of the culture there. <coughs> Excuse me. That is a very important part of the culture. 
is this very strict segregation. I remember one time we were invited to dinner somewhere and the men were sitting in the bedroom and then the women were like in the kitchen living room area. And one of the kids, the kids were like running around in and out of the room. One of the kids had left the door open a little bit and, and the Khalifa was sitting at a position where he could see out the door. He like jumped like from the edge of the room. I still don't know how he did it. He just flew across the room and shut the door. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like even this is before even anything yeah, even yeah, happened. I was right. just like, oh my god! Like so that's really again, strict. very strict. Part of very that. Okay. strict. Okay. So sorry. I <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah, no, that's yeah, a good point. Yeah, yeah. 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 So now you find out what? So now we find out that the main sheikh has been accused of having inappropriate interactions with his female students, including married students, where the the female student is married to another of his students, mm -hmm. right? So the husband and wife are both students of the sheikh, and. Um, like touching, I think kissing and um, just inappropriate stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that blew me away. Cause I was like, this is the guy, you know, he's, I think you mentioned it maybe that we thought of him as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us, you know, literally the best thing since I spread. Like is, we couldn't imagine. Anything. Is he an elderly person? Cause you I mentioned just, that your Khalifa he's... is like a year, your age, but a year or two older, maybe. Yeah, great yeah, question. I've been wondering exactly. that. Cause in my mind, I picture a sort of an aged gentleman so he his hair is uh white yeah. but he's not super old i don't think I, okay. I don't know his exact age i would guess he's probably in his late 60s or something like that now i think so and this was well, a few years ago maybe yeah late 60s early 70s or something okay those lines okay so back then he was probably 60 something like that yeah. in, in his 60s I mean, yeah I would think he so. himself is married uh, has yeah, children kids and adult yeah. children okay. and everything yeah, yeah. yeah maybe even grandchildren yeah maybe uh, yeah. yeah okay so so okay so this comes out. That so this comes out, mm -hmm. yeah. And then I'm. I, it just just devastates me. For right. me, it just felt like you know, just the world just fell apart. But is this? Mm -hmm. Are these accusations cited as the reason why you know some of the Khalifas yeah. are leaving? Yes. Okay. This is the reason. Okay. And so what the story goes that what the the one of the Khalifas recorded him confessing, secretly recorded him, but but that recording's around. I never heard it. And then, but I talked to, to many different people who heard it because they had this rule amongst themselves that they're only going to let scholars listen to it or something like that. Yeah. Whatever it was, they wouldn't let me hear it. But like I said, I, I talked to, um, I, actually, I did talk to some people who, who had heard parts of it who were not scholars. Um, and they all were like, yeah, it's pretty bad. Like he, he basically admitted Confessed to, to it. And, yeah. Okay. To a lot yeah. of this stuff. That's another trend. Um, there's always a confession. And then it's either oh, yeah. like, oh, you know, don't, d d don't, don't believe your, you know, lying or yeah, don't believe your lying ears. Or it's like, you know, <laughs> oh, I was coerced into saying it and I didn't mean yeah. it or whatever. Um, yeah. So there's, yeah, there's always a confession. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 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 yeah so that, that was really bad. Um, and then I still was like, okay, I haven't heard it myself. I mean, it's horrible. It devastated me, but I wanted, I want to know a little bit more. Right. So then I personally talked to two of my friends and their wives who both of them said, yes, our wives met privately um, with the sheikh. Thankfully, alhamdulillah, nothing had happened. Mm. Um, but that's, but he did that. But so, so to me, that was enough evidence that like, I got to just get away from this guy yeah. because that's clear khalwa. Like, what is he doing? Why was seclusion. he seclusion? Seclusion, right. Sorry. That's seclusion with the woman. And I mean, that's pretty clear cut in Ardeen. So why would you do something like that? And then, so now then it became a lot more believable to me that there's these, you know, women who are um, accusing him of, of doing inappropriate things. But I've heard you also mention that the Sheikh would meet with female students in private. In fact, some of the khadims, the you know, like the like the people, like you know, the uh, managers, whatever, sure. uh, would would almost block the door. Yeah, even. they so, would. They so would so it. so he would meet with in private. Yeah, so that's what I found out later on. Oh, but khalwa is in one on one. One on one. Yeah. So so the door locked. It's right. just him and the right, female. Right. But you knew there were event, like occurrences where he met with plural women, like you know, like multiple women at the same time. I so, think so. Yeah, but I not khalwa in the sense of like one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, So because I'm talking about one-on-one. -on -one. Right, right. Yeah, right, right. so that's where it's part. I mean, I think the, the so again, going back to this uh, strict segregation, yeah. um, he would have meetings with women, I think. That's what I've heard. We would never know because if there's women anywhere around, like we'd have to be super far away. But 
Um, and so I actually asked somebody um, who was close to him, I, a different one of his Khalifas uh, who had left him. And I asked him, like, how are the mechanics, like, how is that even possible for him to be in that position to do stuff like that? So that's when he described to me, like, oh, no, what he'll do is he'll have all the men really far away. Then he'll have the women come in one by one. And then they'll, I think he even said, lock the door. And then they'll have khadims in front of the door guarding it to make sure that no men come inside. Like, that's supposedly the reason. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, now, now it turns out that, that yeah. there's all these accusations of really inappropriate interaction. So what do you do then now? With these accusations, I mean, obviously so, your world is, you know, right, right. I mean, you're, obviously your own spiritual, and we'll talk about that. Sure. Your own personal sort of uh, sense of like loss, but like, uh, did you confront the Khalifa? What, what do you do with that bit no. of information? So at this point, I'm still thinking that the Khalifa is still like, I don't have any problem with him because he's not the one that did these things. Mm -hmm. In my mind, it's still just a matter of this sheikh is corrupt, and I'm very sad about it, and. But I'm like, okay, but we still have our Khalifa here. And so I'm still going to all the weekly lessons. I'm still doing all the normal stuff. And our family was, was very close to his family, actually. So tons of interaction. My kids were friends with his kids. My wife would drive um, their, his kids to school and back and things like that. She would interact with his wife. So all that's just still going on. But I'm just feeling really sad. And I have not talked to, um, to, the, uh, to the Khalifa in Chicago about this at all. I'm just too scared to do it mm -hmm. because he's the one that told me don't talk about it yeah. basically. So then, um, sorry, what was your question? I forget. <laughs> oh, what happened? What yeah, happened? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, I basically get very sad and I'm like every night I'm just like, I can't deal with this. I just wish I was dead. Um, that way that, that got that bad. That's yeah. a stress, a big statement. Yeah. I would every single night I would go to bed cause I'd be thinking about it all the time. Yeah. Like how could this happen? And then I would just be like, I would just rather be dead than even have to deal with this thing. So that's a, that's a big statement because it wasn't like ah, that's kind of sucks. Right. And I'm disappointed, but yeah. to go yeah. from that to I'd rather be yeah. dead. That's a very very strong statement. Yep, it is. Yep. And it, uh, how, how does it affect? I mean, because you've talked about this also. So again, you know, I'm kind of leading you, you know, sure. uh, to that to, to to you know talk about. Um, your own spiritual crisis that come that the yes. results of that you know comes as a result of yes. this whole thing exactly so then i get to a point where i say you know if if this is what islam is people like this then i don't even, i don't want to be muslim wow i got to that point and that's even like going back to omar's point like yeah. you're not just disappointed you've contemplated like okay i'd rather just end my life and then number like and then now like if this is Islam, like I'm gonna have nothing to do with it. I mean, but had, wait, but, yeah. if the, but if your relationship with the Khalifa is still good at this point, can't you just say, "Hey, it's a that's that's separate. I still have what I have in locally." Not really, because it was all through. Because it was always it would always go back to the Sheikh. Because the Khalifa would always reference mm -hmm. the Sheikh yeah. as the authority, and me personally, my 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 bea was with the Sheikh. Yeah. But even aside from that all the authority that the Khalifa had was through the Sheikh. Yeah. But what about the sense of community and the, the family that you've mm -hmm. built? Aren't they all kind of keeping things kind of together? Uh, in a physical sense. Yeah. Mm. But for me, it, it was sort of like I've been cut off from the, from the fountain of spirituality. Like the source of it was the Sheikh. And then now I'm learning that he's corrupt. So for me, the whole, the whole model just fell apart. You're right. Day to day, we still had our friends. We're still going to the masjid. I'm still, you know, wearing the clothes and all. Mm -hmm. I'm doing all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all just going through the movements. In my heart, I was just like, "It's over. Like this doesn't make any sense anymore." Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense or if I. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, obviously, as someone who hasn't experienced it, I'm, I'm struggling with it, and I think to an extent, maybe Omar is as well. Because, like, how, how does that then lead you to say, you know, like, like? like this is not just something problematic with this organization or this person, but you know, there's, there's something inherently wrong with Islam. Right. Yeah. So that's, or, I think that's the piece of it that, that, that I'm not articulating very well, okay. which is that they became Islam for me. Mm. Like they were it. Cause remember when I was in his here, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but for people who don't know, they spent a lot of time on proofs of Islam. Like, how do you really know that there's a God? How do you know he's one God? How do you know that, you know, the Quran is from Allah SWT? So I had that in my background. I studied all that and it all made sense to me. But 
after spending 11 years in this group, I, that was gone. I mean, I wasn't thinking about that. It was really just focused on the personality um, of the of the sheikh. So when when that personality fell away, then Islam so it was fell based away. on that feeling of love. Yeah. Right. Oh, totally. And you fell out of love in a sense, and then like, well, if it's all on love and the logical part of it's that you're like the answers that the the, the earlier group was giving you. Yeah. Then and what? Then what's the foundation? Is what you're thinking, right? Right. Um, I mean, this is a minor point, but when you talk about you know, the, the like the personality of the sheikh in, in in those instances where you did meet him or you were in the presence of the sheikh, was it encouraged or was it sort of common practice to, you know, bow or to kiss his hand? Yeah. Was there any of that? Um, like, yeah, there, there was hand different kissing. orders have different ways of approaching things like that. Right. I'm trying to remember because my um. My wife is uh, Afghani, and in their culture, they do a lot of hand kissing, and which took me a little while to get used to. Yeah, and I'm trying to remember if they had, in in or not in in the, um, I I think they did. Hmm. I honestly can't really remember exactly right now. Got it. No, um, no problem. I'm just but curious. Aside from that specific thing, it was always extreme, extreme respect. Like, you know, you don't talk in front of the the, the sheikh loudly. Um, if you sit, you sit. I remember the Khalifa explicitly saying that he he referenced. There's a hadith actually where um, I think where it describes that the Sahaba anhum, they would sit in front of the Prophet so still yes. that a bird could sit on their head, right? Correct. And so he he would he bra I remember before I think it was actually before I gave Bayah very early on he bragged to me that his students are like that when they sit in front of him they're, they're, they sit that still. Mm -hmm. So and that's true. Like there is that level of. Um, Awe and respect. Awe and respect. Yeah. When do yeah. things come to a head with the Khalifa? Yeah. Um, okay. Wait. Sorry. But let me before I get to that, just to answer your question about the um, about the crisis of faith. Um, oh yeah. yeah. So, so I so I, I I went through that whole process of like you know what do I even believe in right now, but that's when when the Hizb Tahrir stuff came in very handy, <laughs> and I was mm. like, you know, I have to think through this logically. I have to start with zero. Assume nothing. And then build from there. And then I was like, no, there absolutely, there's a God for sure. There's, and he's one. And the Prophet Muhammad is definitely um, the messenger of Allah. So I said, him. but I don't believe in all this Sufi stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's at that point that I said, I'm Muslim, but I'm not part of this, um, the self of construct anymore. I just can't do it because, because right. of this experience of, you know, them manipulating me. Right. Now, um, we've talked a lot about sort of the venerative practice, practices, and I, 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 I feel like we've neglected um, talking about um, the actual sort of spiritual practices. That be, because oh, and, sure. I, and, and, I, and I asked that because I know this will come important later because sort of what have you kept? What have you retained, you know, from yeah. these experiences? So, um, because again, it's like the baby with the bathwater kind of thing, like where you, you're not rejecting everything. I mean, certainly at the time you were probably like, okay, I'm done with Sufism. I'm done with, you know, Tariqa, all this kind of stuff. But as far as like suluk, as far as like the actual spiritual path is concerned, what were some of the like commonplace, commonplace exercises that you were commanded, like you were instructed to do? I'm sure there was daily, uh, yeah. uh, you know, lit, like litanies and so on. Right, right. Yeah. There were, yeah, exactly. No, they're all really good, I yeah. think. And I think that there, there's actually nothing wrong with them at all. And some of them, like you said, I, I still retain them. Right. Um, one was a heavy emphasis on muraqaba which is a kind of meditation where you're focusing on your heart. You're imagining that your heart is saying the name of Allah, Allah, Allah. And um, so I find, I, I still find very relaxing and very useful. It helps you, uh, helps be able to focus in prayer. It centers in, you. Outside of, it centers yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. And so you, they would start, I mean, they started me off at five minutes of Marakwa per day mm -hmm. and then eventually got to about an hour per day. Um, which is not easy to do. No, Five minutes is no, hard to actually. It is. <laughs> if you're not used to it, right? Um, I mean, mindfulness those, exercises. I know Omar, yeah. both Omar and I have have uh, participated, and oh, okay. it's hard. So you know, it's, yeah, it's hard, hard to keep things focused or to keep your mind empty of, uh, you know, thoughts yes. that are taking you away from the moment, even if it's for like a five minute sit exactly. as you, as, as you know, you, like you say in mindfulness exercises, yeah, like that five minute sit is difficult, let alone an hour. Right. So it's certainly conditioning. So, okay. So, so, so Morakaba, yep. that's one. Yep. Uh, I imagine again, daily awrad and adhkar. Yeah. hundred times istighfar, um, hundred times, um, through on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, some amount of Quran, I deal about roughly half an hour of Quran recitation per day. 
It was stuff like that. It right. wasn't anything crazy. Got it. Anything like that. Yeah. Okay. That was about it. And, and was there a way to monitor whether you were doing it or not? It was really like sort of up to you to. No, no, no. So yeah, that's a good point. So every week, each student would send in a form wow. with details about how much you oh, did. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. And in that, and I would do it religiously, yeah. not only with my number. And, and by the way, that also in itself became another control mechanism because I could never keep up with it. I could never actually do everything yeah. that he wanted me to I mean, do. Well, at the end of the day, the sheikh is a project manager. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> literally, right? Yeah. No, no, literally. I mean, professionally. Yeah. So he's right. incorporated that into the, yeah. into the tariqa. Right. Yeah. The structure. Yeah. Right. The structure, yeah. time, you know, uh, weekly timesheets. But in this case, it's about, <laughs> right, right. How much time you've spent doing that. Yeah. I mean, no, which is beautiful. Right. But yeah. oh, so you were sorry. You were saying that you couldn't keep up. So what was the sort so of there's, shaming or exactly. so uh, accountability? Always this feeling of guilt. Mm. And, he, and it wasn't by accident because you'd be like, you know, I'm putting so much effort into you guys. You guys can't even do the things I'm asking you to do. So there's a constant guilt, guilt constant tripping. feeling bad, constant fear of upsetting the sheikh, or like I said, just even losing his love or diminishing his love. Um, but in addition, though, the second reason I would always do it is because everybody's vying for his attention and and, and getting answers uh, or getting decisions made for us, right? Like we just got addicted to it. It's like a drug. Like we don't make our own decisions. So we would, in our weekly sheets, we would say, here's what's going on in my life. Here, I need to, I, you know, what should I do about this? What should I do about that? You know? And who is that going to? Like the, the, Khalifa, the Khalifa or the Sheikh? That, okay. that would go to the Khalifa. Okay, got it. Got yeah. It. And so, and he would answer and he, and he would tell me, do this, do that, you know? What's and, the scope of, of like how many of these yeah. is he getting? <laughs> because if he's a practicing physician, yeah. and, and, but at the same time, this is like a full-time job. It, it, and that was an issue, yeah. He it, Towards the end, he had so many students that yeah. he he did have trouble keeping up What's with What's the it. volume here? Well, what are we talking yeah. about? <laughs> probably in the hundreds. Hundreds, okay. Yeah, probably in the hundreds, I, I would think. Yeah, that's a lot. Like across the U.S. And I, like, me, I like how Omar brings up like terms like volume. Well, <laughs> what does scalability look like here? <laughs> exactly. No, but it's true. No, I, but it's the 20 plus years of Silicon Valley in Omar. I yeah. love it. No, love it's it. not even that. Yeah. Even there. Yeah. He, I remember I worked on a project one time to help <laughs> uh, be able to answer. Um, we tried to create an electronic form for him where somehow it would de-identify the submitter. Uh. And then he would be able to, he, I forgot how he did it. Like there was something to do with, he was going to use his voice. It was something because he was doing so much typing, answering all this stuff that his hands were hurting actually. Well, yeah. So, so yeah, so it was actually very spot on. That, that was a real, real issue. Yeah. Um, so back to, so my question yeah. was, yeah. when do things, when does the fallout now oh, move yeah. from the Sheikh to the Khalifa? That's right. Okay. Right. So then, um, <laughs> so it was interesting. There was never a point that, and now I'm just talking about up, up until the time that I left Chicago. So I don't know what happened after I left Chicago, mm -hmm. but from the time that I found out up until I left Chicago, he never publicly talked about it. So he always went on like everything's fine. Okay. Except for, like I said, they quietly took out some things from the website and he stopped making references to him. But, but sort of underground me and other people were talking to each other a lot of people actually and pe most people were just quietly leaving him hmm. that's what was actually happening um i was a lot more vocal and then my my wife saw that i was really struggling with with the whole thing and she knew i was very open with her so she she knew that i was like out my heart was out of the tariqa but i had not told uh the khalifa yet so she kind of pushed it which was really helpful because finally he said let's have a conference call and talk about all your concerns and then what we, it, oh, so what I forgot to mention was that he went to Hajj, the Khalifa went to Hajj and, and, and met with the, the, the main sheikh and whatever conversation they had, he decided to not leave him. Mm. So he stayed his, is till now, I think his Khalifa. Okay. And that really upset me and other people because we thought, oh yeah, the sheikh was screwed up, but we all, all along, we thought you're still a good guy. But now it looks like you're not even, you know, you, you're still with him. And so if you're with him, just be with him then, like the other Khalifas. Or if you're not with him, cut off completely like the other Khalifas. But this particular Khalifa in Chicago, he's, as far as I know, the only one who has this position of, and he said this, that he will not communicate with the Sheikh, but he will also not leave him. 
Yeah. So it didn't make any sense to us. Right. It goes back to that initial, right, uh, when you had that first conversation with him, which is like, on the one hand, it's not an outright cover up. Like you would almost accept that or not accept it, but you know what I mean? You would, you would expect it, excuse me. Um, and then to an extent you would accept it. Okay. Like, yeah, I get it. You know, these people are playing cover. They're, they're, you know, playing interference for the Sheikh. It's not outright that, but at the same time, it's, you know, so it's like really strange. It it just baffles me about what his calculus is. Uh, I don't know if he'll agree to be on the podcast. You can ask him. Yeah. When you are leaving, when you decide to leave Chicago, well, hold is on. This, what, is this yeah. a confront? I'm just curious what, where the if what to what degree there's yeah. a confrontation with the Sheikh, oh, yeah. with the Khalifa. Khalifa. Yes. So there was. So at this conference. Oh yeah, that's what I was getting to. So so my wife, both of us are upset about this whole thing that he's not actually leaving him. So she emails him. He says, "Hey, let's let's get on a conference call. I'll answer all your questions." So we get on a conference call, and I'm honestly I'm still hoping that somehow he'll explain everything and everything will be fine and we'll just go back to how things were. Not with the sheikh, but at least mm-hmm. with him. But he just gives all this like crazy stuff. Why are you guys backbiting? And just stuff that didn't make any sense to us at all. And um, I, I try to even prod him like, hey, what about this? What about that? Hoping hoping that he'll actually give us, you know, meaningful answers. But nope, it was just the same, you know, just, just dancing around things mm-hmm. and just making excuses didn't make sense. And so at the end of that call, I told him, that's when I finally said, you know what? Um, I remember the, uh, the words I used were "I love you like my father." Going back to the whole father thing, I love you like my father, but I can't be your student anymore. And I, you know, I'm not part of this thirty five. Not even older brother. You said like father. father. That way, that's how yeah. I thought of him. He's wow. one year older than me, but I thought of him that way. So, yeah, and and I forget if now uh, you 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 mentioned it on this interview, or I've heard it to you, or heard it elsewhere. Mm-hmm. But you talk about your relationship with the Khalifa is more than just even Khalifa kind of murid or Khalifa, you know, or whatever, you know, yeah. f- disciple. It's, it's, is it, doesn't he, he lives like right down the street from you. Around the corner. Around yeah. the corner. Um, so again, going back to Omar's kind of social uh, and family dynamic, um, the, you know, what Omar raised. And then number two, he, like you're renting the house from, <laughs> sorry. Yes. Is that from him? Yeah, from him. He owns the house that you live in. Not only that. Before he bought it, he had us check out the house and said, do you guys like this house? Yeah. And so he was very, like, with stuff like that, he was really, really good to us. And yeah, I mean, we were, we, I would argue we were probably the closest family to him at that time, oh. to his family. Physically, right. we were. A lot of interaction. Um, children. Children. Friends. And he was, you know, they would come for dinner. We would go to their place for dinner. This was like a really good relationship. Yeah. Um, and so when this whole thing happened, I was like, Oh my god, it's super awkward because you know he's my landlord. <laughs> so, yeah. and he I was mean, always good to us. Like yeah, I have to be honest, he right, was very good to us. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I've talked about this on on the podcast. So I don't mind mentioning it, but like you know, when the when when everything happened with Osama, you know, God 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 bless him and rest his soul. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, for me, the struggle was not just someone you know who uh, like it wasn't just it, well, I never had like a student teacher relationship, but he wasn't you know. But it but it was like not just like organizationally what we were dealing with. For me, the struggle was this is a friend, this was a neighbor, this was you know someone who you know our children played together. Like we had a very very intimate relationship. So you, it's not only a loss of like a board member and a founder kind yeah. of relationship. For me, it was. Like the loss of a friend, the loss of a of a, of a colleague, of, of someone who Huge. I saw as a younger brother, it, you know. And so it, it's it's it, there's so many layers. I imagine, yeah. and I, I'm not trying to project onto you, but I imagine there's some of that going on. Oh, there with, was a lot of it. With, there with were times I would just be Khalifa. crying, yeah. just crying because I had such a close relationship with him. Yeah, with the Khalifa. Even now, honestly, every now and then I'll just remember like the old times and yeah. how close I was. And I just start crying. Like I, this is really painful. Right, very, and, very painful. And I know you have, and I know you'll talk about this when you talk about the departure from Chicago. But you know, it, it, this leads to some of the trauma with your children. I mean, because your children, right. this is the only home they've known. Yep. You've lived in Chicago most of their lives, yep. and so you know now you're saying, okay, guess what, kids, we're leaving. Yeah. So yeah. they're rea- they're responding on an, almost an entirely different level. Like it's all intimate and personal, and uh, not so much religious or anything no. like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even though they're yeah. probably what teenagers by this point. They are. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
they're they're entering. The youngest was not technically so, a teenager, but yeah, they were. You're asking your high schooler to leave the high school that he or she went to. You're asking them yeah. to leave their best friends, their so, friends, yeah, yeah. their social circle, everything. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, that was super rough. So, so yeah. So, so from that yeah. point, after telling um, the Khalifa that I'm leaving. Then he followed up and, and tried to talk to me a few times and, and basically try to, you could say either he's trying to convince me to come back or you could say he's trying to justify what he did. Whatever it was, I wasn't buying anything. I was just, and I was so relieved, by the way, after that conversation, when I told him that I'm gone, it was such a huge relief. And my wife had been telling me for months, like, this is messing you up. You have to just come clean and tell him. And I just couldn't bring myself to do it. So that helped a lot, alhamdulillah. But ironically, the the very next weekend after um, we had this conference call with him, the other Khalifa who did openly and publicly leave, actually the main one who, in fact, the one who recorded the Sheikh confessing, he happened to be in Chicago. And my wife had connections um, to him and his wife because she was taking classes. They had like online Islamic classes and stuff. So I said, can you ask him if he's willing to chat with us and, and, and meet with us? And, and he agreed actually. So I went and sat with him, and then that's when he just kind of spilled the beans on the whole thing. And the big reveal shocker was that it was actually the Chicago Khalifa who initially noticed that the sheikh was having these inappropriate meetings with women. The, the, the Chicago Khalifa? Yeah. Your, okay. Right. Your My landlord. Guy. My landlord. <laughs> He's the <laughs> one. So that's what made it even more baffling. Like, Absolutely. why is he still with him? Like, what's going on here? So I, I know a lot about this group only, uh, you know, and we, you and I met very recently, but yeah. I've known about this because a very close friend of mine, uh, and I almost want to ask about his involvement with all of this, um, but I don't want to name him. But if you know who I'm referring to, uh, a very close friend of mine, you know, I, I know I knew about the fallout because of what happened with him. Um but any, like, I'm just curious on a personal level, sorry, without maybe getting too personal or naming names, uh, what's his relationship with all of this? Well, sorry, I actually, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> so sure. So it's okay, it's to. okay, it's sorry. okay. Let, it, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just leave it at that. Um, okay, no, 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 I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll ask you off air. Um, uh, sorry, listeners. Um, but okay. uh, the, uh, so I, I guess then my question is, why do you think certain people stayed? Like we've talked about this really weird yes. kind of, um, you know, it, it, like how your Khalifa responded to this. But what about, um, what about, um, uh, yeah, like why did others stay? In your, in your mind. Yeah, I, I could never figure it out because I thought everybody was going to be like me, like when they found out. But I, I thought that what, when they found out um, what was going on, that they would just be like, I'm out of here. Because it seemed very logical to me and that's what I did and that's what the few friends that I talked to did as well. Um, but what I found was the people who I, because I would privately just talk to people I was comfortable with and tell them, almost none of them left. And it would just always be like, oh, I'm still benefiting from him. So I'm just going to stick around. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? Like, why would you, if you, you know that his sheikh is corrupt and he's doing stuff that doesn't make any sense. And, oh, by the way, I, I didn't mention something else. Um, w once I decided to leave, and it was at that point that I was able to look back at everything critically. And that's what I was like, oh my God, from the beginning, they were doing all these mind control things and mm -hmm. I just couldn't see it. You know, but then, but then like my friends, I would point everything out to them. I would just lay it all out for them, spoon feed, basically everything. And they just didn't want to leave. They just stayed with yeah. them. A lot of them are still with them. The majority stayed? I would say, well, I don't know. So people I've talked to, because I don't follow with the group at all yeah. uh, directly, um, but people I've talked to, um, they basically, um, they said that roughly half the people have left. I don't know the exact. I'm sure it's, it's not a exactly lot. 50%. It's, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a That would be number. for any organization half leaving would be a decimation, right? Yeah. But but so here's the kicker. They quickly recruited new young people. Mm. So that's so, kind of what was sad about that. So I, I wanted to I wanted to present something that, you know, yeah. um there's a psychologist Leon Festinger and mm. he writes in his book When Prophecy Fails. Um, and he talks about how people's attachment to an initial idealistic vision of the cult is what keeps them with, you know, keeps them in it mm. long after, you know, th that there's the, the, that the fantasy has been exposed. 
Interesting. You know, and 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 he also calls on the or he borrows on the theory of cognitive cognitive dissonance. Yeah, right. I'm sure it's that. Right, where there's this like, like there's the unpleasant feeling that arises when your established beliefs are confronted by clearly contradictory, you know, evidence. So exactly. do, would you think that, they, would you agree that that's probably what's going on I think on that's here? exactly what it is. I think, mm -hmm. I think they can't, it's just too uncomfortable for them to be like, hey, I, so th th there's actually, so that's one aspect of it, right? Okay. The cognitive dissonance. But I think the other aspect of it too is that if they leave, now they're admitting that they got duped. It's like any con, right? Like, the, like at least from the little bit of research I've done, yeah. person gets con a lot. They don't want to go around announcing to the whole world that they, they got Con or even to themselves, right? They or don't want to admit it to themselves. It is right. It's it's because it, that I mean, it, and I don't you know want to make it sound like an ego thing, but it's, uh -huh. it is right. It's where your ego says, "Look, I, I'm I'm too smart. I'm too yeah. intelligent to have been duped like this." Yeah. So, I think there's a little bit of that as well. Like I think there's so. ego. There's cognitive dissonance. There's maybe this idyllic vision of of what the organization sought to be. And so you still hold on to hopes that, you know, you, you know, like the organization can still achieve that in spite totally. of this little hiccup. Totally agree. <laughs> right. I mean, I put the yeah. word hiccup in quotes, but right. because obviously it's more than a hiccup, but because I, to me, I don't understand how you move on from that point, right? Where there's been this complete loss of trust and, you know, and, 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 and authority in the leadership, in the leader, how do you then just kind of move on and say, well, there's still, right. Um, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like why I can still retain affiliation, right. Without, you know, just saying, look, because again, you're, because here you, there is still a sense of affiliation because you're not just, it's one thing to say, you know what, I haven't given, given up on the edifice that is the soul wolf. I haven't right. given up on the Tariqa model, but it's yet another entirely different thing to say. Not only have I not done any of those things, I still believe in the Sheikh. Yep. I still believe in his uh, wilaya or his nispa or his whatever, right? Yep. So that's that's what's really interesting. I no, I agree with you, yeah. and and I think the other dynamic in this is that keep in mind that these are broken people. These are people who came in because they have some trauma in their life. And most of my friends that I know that are in the group, they almost all had some major thing. That's what got them in, in the first place, you know. And then so now that this happens. Who knows what they're going through? And that's, by, by the way, that's one of the reasons that I purposely didn't make a big stink in Chicago while I was there. Because I was like, I know where I was at. Um, and maybe these people aren't ready to hear it. Um, uh, but it was also partly because, I, you know, he was my landlord. And I, yeah, and I yeah. just needed to smoothly just get out of Chicago. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah. One, well, one of the part. things you haven't talked about um, is because I know this occurred is there was actual intimidation, though. For you to speak out, like against you speaking out. So when you did decide to go public, I think you mentioned like Facebook or social media where you basically spilled the beans. Um, there were threats that were made. Yeah, kind threats of. Threats of black magic or intimidation tactics that were used, right? Yeah, yeah. So so a few things happened. One was I made this Facebook post um, and it was very explicit about the, the sheikh but not the khalifa. But people could read between the lines and, and, and they knew what I was trying to say. And so there was a response to me kind of pushing back on what I said. And so I, I, I then made a, a very long detailed response to that because I, could, I knew that I know this person and, and I knew that they didn't know the full story. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing that happened. Another thing that happened was the main sheikh has a reputation. I don't know if it's true or not true, but I think it, it probably is because multiple people told me about it, that he has students that actually practice black magic. And so they said he, he could just tell his students to do black magic on people he doesn't like. And their proof was that they claim everybody who spoke out against him publicly, some, they all suffered some kind of calamity. So they were telling me, I, I mean, they, they, were, they were actually doing it to help me. They, they were doing right. it out of sincerity. They, just, they didn't want anything to happen to me. But they were saying like, hey, be careful. Don't say anything publicly because he can do black magic on you. You know, down, yeah. and I, I mean, and it's probably true. I mean, I, it, I mean, you yeah. know, I don't have any reason to think it's not true, but I talked to some scholars cause I, I really didn't feel like it's right for me to be um, intimidated, like you said, and, and, and cowed by that kind of stuff. Yeah. So a, sh a scholar told me like, here you, you recite some, you know, I think the last three series of the Quran and stuff and don't worry about it. Yeah. So that's what I did. 
Yeah. Right. Um, now, like, again, like an organization like this that is well known, has followers, hundreds of thousands, like you claim, right? Or like, like you stated, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, and you know, uh, is there a response from other scholars or other organizations when these accusations come out? What's the response oh. there? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that a very famous big. scholar issued a. Yes. Mufti Taqi Usmani issued a fatwa, but unfortunately, well, I'm sure he had his reasons, you know, he's, he's a very respectable scholar. Yeah. He didn't name the Sheikh, but I personally asked um, people who had connections directly to uh, Mufti Taqi Usmani's school. And they said, yes, absolutely. It is about this particular Sheikh. What was the, what was the fatwa? Just saying that, that, you know, there's financial fraud that he's doing inappropriate stuff with women. Um, you haven't mentioned, mentioned that, by the way, like yeah, until now. There was right. also financial misconduct right. or accusations of financial Correct. misconduct. Correct. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? I don't know a ton about okay. it. I think it was a lot of like um, collecting money for a project that he's doing in Pakistan, but then just using it for personal mm. personal stuff. Yeah. I mean, th they have a reputation of being super, super luxurious. So, you know, first class Ticket, airplane mm. tickets, the most expensive, you know, purses and just the, the family, kind of the stuff. family of the family. Yeah. yeah. So misappropriation of, yeah. of, of funds. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, again, I mean, you know, you talk about authority figures or, the, you know, uh, like Mufti Taqi Usmani, yeah. right? Issuing a fatwa. That's yeah. not, that's not, that's not light. No, no. So, um, yeah, I mean, I wonder if that impacts any of the, any of the murids or scholars or, I mean, I'm sorry, murids of, within the, within the I, school. I don't, it doesn't yeah. seem like it, mm. which is kind of strange. I mean, what I heard was that for the main sheikh, roughly half his, um, again, that's a number about half, but half his khalifas and uh, students left him i'm talking about worldwide within in pakistan and africa he had a lot of students and like that um but then a good number uh stayed with him you know? so uh, one thing i would love to learn or just discuss uh amongst us is the kind of the current status yeah of of uh like especially american youth joining uh, these types yeah. of three, because is that still happening? And to what degree? I'm curious. Yeah. Now, I don't know if we want to go there just no, yet. No, no, I, I think but it's I do a great want to touch on that. I agree. And then we can obviously wrap up. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Have some closing uh, thoughts. No, I mean, like right here, I, yeah, like I wanted to talk about sort of your takeaways. Yeah, and I think that's oh, Jomer's sure. point, right? So, we'll, and and um, you know, it's it's a question that a friend of ours, a mutual friend of all three of ours, wanted me to ask you. So oh, okay. I'm, go I'm going to ask you. Yeah, so yeah. Um, he said, "Well, if you got Yusuf on the podcast, you have to ask Yusuf <laughs> this." Um, in your mind, and and you can you can defer, but um, I'd rather you not, um, or I should say, demure in terms of saying, "Well, I don't have the expertise to answer this question." But just in your personal opinion, no sure. one's going to hold you to it. Sure. Do you think that the tariqa model is sort of more abundant or outdated in the modern world or in the West or in America in particular, right? And I think this goes to Omar's point. Yeah. Like, like, do you think that entire model is just something that we need to just, you know, it's like a vestige of the past that we need to just get rid of? That actually is my opinion. Yeah. Um, and why? I, and yeah. So I, so here I have here, why or why not? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I could tell you why. This friend of ours is pretty thorough, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wasn't no. just going to let you give a one-word answer. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, I love it. Um, yeah. No, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think that's that's a um, that's a really important thing to think about. And I'll just tell you my personal yeah, opinion, yeah. and that's it. It's just my personal opinion. That's right. So uh, I should say it's my opinion slash theory. So my theory is that even more fascinating <laughs> <laughs> is that in the past, I think that probably made sense. You would have a sheikh. Let, let's just imagine yeah. 400 years ago in, 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 in Ottoman Turkey, let's just say Ottoman, yeah. you know, Turkey area. You have some super pious um, sheikh. You know, um, every, everything just lives his life according to Sharia, the constant dhikr, uh, the hajj, the whole nine yards. Yeah. Okay? Known for his piety. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so people in that context, they're like, oh, we, we also want to be you know, super Muslims, or we want to be better. Now, think about the context, though. They're already living in a Muslim society. They're very unlikely they're going to be even seeing anything haram, adhan, you know, five times a day. Like, their whole life is actually geared towards, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that context, then you have a sheikh who can help them get to a higher level. Okay. They want to do a little more than just the basics. Right. 
But there also there's checks and balances. So if that sheikh flies off the rails and starts saying crazy stuff and starts trying to manipulate people and control them, well, there's you just go to the qadi. You just go. Somebody will will, will put him in check because the whole society is Muslim anyway, mm-hmm. and they can they can point out in a heartbeat that this guy's corrupt or something's wrong. And I'm just th- I'm just theorizing like yeah. the amount of things you could do in private 400 years ago versus the amount of things you yeah. can do in like Crazy. wiring money and spending money online or or talking to women behind like that just wasn't even yeah. possible. Exactly, years that's ago, a great right? point. So the, fin- the fraud, you yeah. financial, you mentioned financial fraud right. and inappropriate relations. Like, could you, you know, you couldn't really get away with that uh, 100, 200, 400 years ago yeah. in, the, in, uh, in the Muslim village. Uh, right. And these type of like sort of tariqas or orders, you know, or, or like, let's say you have a following around a particular sheikh. Um, you know, the, it, 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 it takes years, decades for it to spread and block. Like this right. could be said about the schools, like whether we're talking about the schools of law, but it can also be said about the uh, the various turuq that, you know, you essentially start off exactly in the model you're describing. And then over decades and maybe even centuries, it spreads. Right. And then you become sort of this global phenomenon. But initially, like the scope, if you will, or the scalability, right? I was, I was joking. Like, it's, we're talking pretty small scale. Right. You're talking about the village. You're talking about right. a particular region, maybe, that where that person may be known. Right. And people may come from, like, a distance of, like, I don't know, a day's journey on, on horseback to come and sure. study or, and sit with the sheikh. It, it, now, with yeah. social media, with, 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 you, with online platforms... The, the reach is global. The reach is endless. Right. And, and, and that's just that. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking that 400 years ago, if you joined the tariqa, your life of your brother who wasn't in the tariqa and you was probably like only a few degrees different. Like, right. hey, you're still living in this yeah. uh, very Muslim yeah. land. Here, you almost have to go seclude yourself from like mainstream society and yeah. become like part of a cult. Like Good it's point. a different, it's yeah, a different, yeah, yeah. it's like, a thousand uh, ma- times magnitude of a yeah. of a like a, a rejection of mainstream versus uh, what you're doing, right? Great, Whereas great point. Yeah. Has several hundred years ago, it's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing that, and and but yeah. my brother is a carpenter, but also equally yeah. pious, right? Yeah. Something exactly. like that. That's right? a great exactly. point. Great point. Yeah. Um, so there was like, a, yeah. So, so so the milieu, the infusion of like Muslim, you know, like uh, piety, the infusion of that was 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 there, and so. Right. Um, and then, like you also mentioned, like the checks and balances in terms of like you could go to the Qadi, you could go to, exactly. you know, like the state apparatus would yep. help you mitigate against any kind of like issues of like abuse. Or they might even things. proactively do it. The, right. I don't know. Right. Right. You know. Right. But right. You, yeah, but there's something there. Right. Right. To keep them in check. Right. And because any, any, anything else? Any other yeah. any other kind of thoughts on yeah. reasons you have Why? your viewpoint? Yeah. yeah. Well, Thank yeah. You. So then I think. Now, and you just like you mentioned, in, in our current context, you're not talking about people, especially in the West, and I would say probably a lot of the Muslim world too, just from the little bit I've seen through my travels and stuff. You're really just talking about people, they're struggling to pray five times a day. A lot of people struggling to keep their iman. I mean, that's where the, the, the battle lines are now. It's not about becoming a, a, this, you know, a wali khas, like we mentioned earlier, yeah. or this super duper Muslim. Mm-hmm. Like, this is very low level. We're just trying to maintain our Islam almost. Um, and so now, then, in that, in our current context, now to inject this idea of, hey, you know, this sheikh is going to make you um, really, really even closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then they have all these, um, like we talked about earlier, all these c- c- kind of tools of abuse that they can use. Um, then it, it, there's a very high risk that a person, in, in the, if you give them that much authority over you, I feel that there's just too much risk that that person could abuse it. Mm. And that's why I'm against it. Okay. Now, I have very close friends that are still part of it. I respect it. I, you know, you, you do what you got to do. Mm-hmm. But just from what I've seen, I think there's, there's just too high of a risk that that, um, that, that authority can be abused. Mm-hmm. Um. And so, uh, and this is also kind of a personal question, uh, is what would you say to maybe anyone listening to the show right now who knows exactly who you're talking about? And they say, oh man, you know, Yusuf, he's just bitter. He, he's just, this is just PTSD talking. Like, uh, you know, his, his resentment, his, his, his views on the organization, on the sheikh, it, you know, it all stems from that. What would you say to any detractors like that that are out there? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that could be true. Uh, I certainly think that I ha- have PTSD. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I'm not right. a doctor. I can't right. really diagnose myself, but um, 
I think that's true. But I would I would invite them to to just take a critical look at it and and say like, hey, um, just give it a chance. If I'm wrong, that's fine. Then they, they don't lose anything. But if I'm right about it, then they've really put themselves and probably their families at a lot of risk. I mean, I can't tell you like till now our family is really damaged by all this. You know, we're still not fully over it. There's still a lot of residual problems because of what we went through. Um, how long have you been back now in, um, in California? Five years. Okay, so this was five okay. Years. So this is five plus years ago. Um, so we we came back five years ago, but then but then uh, we found out about it in um, 2016. So we were in Chicago for about a year and a half or so before we left. We left. Okay, that's what I'm asking. So you yeah. you, you came back here in like 2018. Uh, end of 2017. Uh, okay, got it, got it. Okay, okay. Um, I guess then final question as we wrap is, you know, and I mentioned this in the past or, you know, earlier, but, um, and this goes also to the question of like your views on the study model, if you will. Um, how do we resist the urge to like throw the baby out with the bathwater? And, and, and so what's good? Like talk about some of the good things that you've still and, retained. Yeah and, and, yeah. and, and I think, yeah, I think the way to kind of exp is like, okay, you know, you went from Hezbollah Tariqah to Tariqa, like where have, where have you kind of landed steady mm, state? Great point. That's great probably, question. That's probably oh, answers yeah. that question. Yeah, great question. These are really good questions. So I don't have great answers. <laughs> 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 I could just tell you what actually happened. Yeah. Um, first thing is that, um, sorry, sorry. What, tell me your, what was your question? Uh, oh, like resisting the urge of throwing well, the baby three, out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like what I, yeah, the yeah. good stuff that I got. Exactly. So I got a lot of really good stuff out of it. Um, that, so one thing was just to, how to, how to deal with my wife and kids. So they were really good about, um, um, just the, talking about the rights of the wife. What are some best practices for, for raising your kids? It wasn't perfect, mm -hmm. but I didn't have it. And I, actually till now, I haven't really found any other good sources. That because you were, it sounds like you were getting like one-on-one -on -one coaching essentially for, get for. I specific, was getting that, right? but it wasn't just that. They also had lectures online mm -hmm. that are pretty detailed, mm -hmm. um, but, but th their explanations were so good about why it's important to treat your wife well, for example, mm -hmm. um, that I remember when I listened to it, I just immediately just completely changed my, uh, my approach and it helped our relationship tremendously mm -hmm. till now, mm -hmm. you know, so that was one really huge thing. Um, what about, what about in terms of like your pra spiritual practice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, that was also huge. The Morakaba helps uh, tremendously, um, again, to focus before that, you know, like I think mo probably most people, you start praying, your mind just goes a million mm -hmm. different places and you can't focus. Mm -hmm. So now Alhamdulillah, I feel like pretty regularly I can pray and I can actually focus on Allah SWT. That was unheard of before mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's huge. So I, yeah. that's why one of the reasons I try to maintain my Marakaba um, practice. Okay. And like in terms of where he landed, do you, do you think? Yeah, I think, I think you have a sense, right? You've given a good sense of kind of where you're at. Yeah. I, and, and I struggle with this. Like, um, part of it is, um, that I, I just, I needed time to just get over it. Cause I just think about it all the time. And it was, it was really bad. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've heard one, um, expert on cults say that, uh, it takes roughly five years for a person to get their own identity once they've left a cult. And for my experience, that sounds about right. So it's been a little over five years for me. Um, and I think it's just only now that I'm kind of like, just feel more grounded. Um, because cause I really was just floating around for a long time. I was just like, I don't know what to do. Like, mm. you know, I, I love this thing, but I don't really have a good re replacement for it. Mm -hmm. But now I feel more, a little more confident in, in, in the sense of like, you know, now, as we were talking about briefly earlier, about finding some place for me to study. Like I would love to continue my Islamic studies and stuff in a place that I, I, I don't feel threatened, mm -hmm. you know, by some kind of, you know, uh, person shift, manipulating or, or taking thing, advantage yeah. of the yeah. situation. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Michelle, yeah. I think there's, I think there are avenues out there. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah. And we can certainly, uh, talk about that. Uh, yeah. but, um, yeah, um, I guess the final point, because then I'm going to just sort of conclude um, yeah. with some thoughts, um, is uh, where can people maybe find out more about your story? I know you've shared it on other platforms and mediums, so I want to make sure that people don't think that we're sort of, you know, there's any sort of territoriality here. Um, so mm -hmm. feel free to share some of the other appearances you've had. I, I think I, I listened to uh, the Experience podcast. 
Yes. Yeah. Yep. Was that a friend of yours who? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. so, um, yeah, Let's... the host of that podcast, yeah. we took a class on podcasting together at Sanford <laughs> Continuing Education. Got it. But unlike me, she actually did produce a podcast. Okay. Um, Is she so local here? She's to the local. Bay Area? Yeah. She's oh, in okay. uh, Palo Alto. Got it. Got very, it. So, very nice person. so there's an episode of the Experience Podcast where people can find out more about, um, uh, yep. your story that maybe areas we didn't cover. And then sure. I know for folks, um, they can also find you. There's a couple of videos of yours on YouTube. Yes. Uh, I think you, you, you gave a talk on, again, you're sharing your experiences at, uh, MCC in Pleasanton and that's available exactly. on, um, on YouTube. Um, yep. anything else I'm missing that? Uh, yeah. So the MCC yeah. East Bay, um, right. uh, YouTube channel has that talk. Um, also, uh, in Sheikh's clothing also did a, a little interview with me. So they, they, on, on that page, um, they have the text of that interview and, and they, they also separately, um, posted the same talk that I gave at MCC. East okay. Bay. Okay. So you can get it through both. Yeah. yeah. Ways. And I'm, I, I'm so glad you, I completely forgot that connection as well. Oh yeah, no in, in Shakes Clothing because yeah. uh, we've had the founder of uh, of of of, of uh, In Shakes Clothing, um, um, Danish Kwasim, yes, on, the, on, yes. on the show in the past, yes. um, and I know that they have several scholars like Dr. Rania uh, right. and uh, Rami Nishur who are involved, and sure who are involved right. with the, with the organization. So yeah, no, they're um, excellent. Yeah, okay, they, they okay. And there's, I know there's other organization. There's, I think there's an organization named uh, called Heart, I believe, in in Chicago. I've heard of it. Right. I don't know a lot about it. Yeah. But. Also, kind of, and then I know that uh, uh, Dr. Ingrid Matson uh, right. started something called the Horma Project, yes. which also, again, you know, trying to serve. Like what our community needs is like sort of ombudsmen and ombudsman organizations that actually, you know, not only investigate the, you know, these, these type of instances, but also, you know, kind of lessons learned, best practices for organizations. I know I reached out, you know, at the time when I was on the board of Talif and we were trying to put together like best practices for nonprofits, you know, and I was trying to collaborate with other organizations who have not only struggled with similar issues, but also, you know, just these type of sort of third party organizations like Heart and uh and and in shakes clothing that are trying to put together like i said a syllabus for organizations nonprofits, yeah. muslim spaces where we can avoid you know these type of things what are the ch sort of checks and balances you can put in place um to prevent these kinds of things from happening totally makes sense and have you, have you heard of uh face I yes sorry face. face is another one thank yeah. you are in they texas also based no something. you're right texas i think yeah yeah, yeah. I, I also don't know a ton about them but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the little bit i know seem like they're doing good work that's right. Um, I don't know, Omar, if you had any sort of closing No, just, it was funny because I was thinking about it from an, from an HR perspective. <laughs> it's really important yeah. to put in, you can't just say, let's not do this, right? right. If, an, an organization has to put in place the structure. So you, it prevents their members or their uh, leaders, employees, whatever it is, from even being able to even get close to there you go. being in, in that gray zone, right? Yep. So you're just like, that, that's where like comp eight compliance is what they call it typically. It comes in, it's all these checks and balances. So hopefully, inshallah, we'll see as folks like you share your stories, then that becomes a trigger for people to take action. That's kind of the whole point of sharing your story, right? It's, it's, exactly. Inshallah will lead to some positive outcome. So I, on behalf of uh, Omar and myself, I want to thank you, sir, for gifting us and our listeners his time and sharing what we can all appreciate um, was a dark and difficult chapter of his life. So thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you for your candor, your vulnerability, your courage. Um, and, you know, a, a note I wanted to make to our listeners is that you know, you know that we here at Diffuse Congruence have gone out of our way and made a deliberate attempt um, to stay clear of discussing controversial or salacious topic du jour on social media simply for the sake of content downloads or to hear ourselves pontificate or for you to hear ourselves pontificate. Rather, when we bring up these issues that are controversial, salacious, uh, that may seem to expose the ugly, uh, the ugly um, uh, underbelly of the community. It's to engage in a meaningful discussion, to educate, to inform. Um, and I hope that today's episode served those objectives. Um, you know, some scholars theorize that levels of religiosity and cultic affiliation tend to rise in proportion to the perceived uncertainty of an environment or a time. 
the less control we feel that we have on circumstances, the more likely we are to entrust our fates to a higher power or an authoritarian figure. This propensity has been offered as an explanation of why cults proliferated during times of great social and political uh, tumult. Um, and these themes have been noted by sociologists such as Emil Durkheim and Max Weber, who wrote about fringe religious groups and how they rise during times of social unrest. For Durkheim, religion and societal and cultural norms and values act as a kind of social glue. And in times of rapid social change, notwithstanding the time we live today, uh, existing rules, habits, and belief no longer holds. And in that type of an environment, it becomes ripe for exploitation, and usually by a charismatic individual who purports to have all of the answers to your problems. Um, Durkheim referred to this personal feeling of change, this loss of values, beliefs, and rules as anime, uh, which basically means that Anything, everything, anything and everything in your life is going down the tubes and you need to produce, there's a desperate need to produce a need uh, or a sense of meaning, belonging and control. Um, I want to conclude today's show with a quote that um, I found not only to be relevant to today's episode, but moreover is relevant to what we aim to do with the podcast. Um, in fact, something we have discussed directly uh, in some of our more recent episodes, uh, which is the power of storytelling. Um, William J. Bernstein is a American financial theorist and neurologist. Um, he wrote a book called Delusions of Crowds, um, which is a survey of financial and religious manias. Um, and, 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 and this book, The Delusions of Crowds, is actually inspired by uh, uh, Charles McKay's 1984 work, uh, excuse me, 1841 work, um, Memoirs of Extraordinary Power, Popular Delusions, and Madness of Crowds. McKay saw crowd dynamics as central to phenomenon as disparate as, disparate as the Crusades all the way to the witch hunts um, and other types of programs. Um, Bernstein uses the lessons of ev evolutionary psychology and neuroscience to elucidate and expound on some of McKay's observations and argues that our propensity to um, en masse glom on to uh, these type of extremities or extremes, excuse me, is determined in part by a hired wire, uh, a, excuse me, a, a, a hardwired weakness that we have for stories. He writes, humans understand the world through narratives. However much we flatter ourselves about our individual rationality, a good story, no matter how analytically deficient, lingers in the mind, resonates emotionally, and persuades more than the most dispositive of facts or data. For nearly 10 years, um, we've been honored to capture the life experiences and stories from so many within the American Muslim community. Um, and God willing, inshallah, we will continue to do just that. Um, but it truly is something that we are honored by the fact that we've been able to not only sit across from these individuals and ask questions in a way that can, that, that can shape, that can um, uh, that can, uh, you know, um, have them respond in a way where they share their stories, uh, share intimate moments of their lives, defining moments in their lives. Um, it's really been an honor. So I want to thank not only all of the sort of guests we've had over the past 10 years, if that's possible. I want to thank you again, Yusuf. Um, and of course, I want to thank our listeners. Um, and uh, for this particular episode also, I would be remiss if I did, didn't acknowledge and give a huge shout out to Janaid Hassan for bringing use of story to our attention. Janaid is a longtime listener. More importantly, <laughs> he is the older brother to this show's co-founder and past co-host, Zaki Hassan. So that makes him veritable royalty as far as I'm concerned for the show. So thank you and a huge shout out again to Janaid Hassan. Um, as always, dear listeners, please reach out with questions, comments, find us on iTunes, 
um, or wherever you find your favorite podcast platform and like, subscribe, leave a review and share and disseminate through your network. Every little bit is appreciated. Every little bit, every, every little bit helps. Finally, if you want to show support, um, sh- show support uh, for the show, uh, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash diffuse congruence and become a patron, a monthly patron. Uh, inshallah, God willing, in the near future, we plan on unveiling special content and features that is going to be only available to our patrons. So if you haven't already, please do so. Every little bit, you can sign up as little as a dollar a month to sky's the limit. So anyway, inshallah, thank you for all those who are existing patrons of the show. We couldn't be here without you. And catch us next time in the next episode, in the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. I'm <laughs> <laughs>